If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 176, Counter Programming and Jurassic Park Preludes While many people were eagerly anticipating the release of the film Jurassic Park, Universal Studios and Warner Brothers took an unexpected approach. These two major film studios, part of the Big Six, learned about the July 20 release date for Jurassic Park and decided to release their highly anticipated movies around the same time to compete with it. Universal Studios had planned to release Unforgiven in August, but upon realizing the impending release of Jurassic Park on July 20, they rescheduled their own movie for July 16. As a result, when Jurassic Park marketing efforts began, Universal Studios had already been promoting their own films. However, these promoted films failed to captivate the audience in the same way Jurassic Park did. Universal Studios believed that they could attract more viewers if they released a movie they had confidence in around the same time as Jurassic Park, in an attempt to compete and potentially steal the box office success from Jurassic Park, which would have been detrimental to Kishin Pictures. As for Warner Brothers, their movie Batman Returns had originally been scheduled for a June release in cinemas. However, Warner Brothers. CEO and executives, anticipating the release of Jurassic Park, made the decision to postpone the screening date, aiming to release their film in close proximity to Jurassic Park. As a result, Warner Brothers premiered Batman Returns on July 16. This strategic move by the two film studios to adjust their movie release dates to align with Jurassic Park was termed counter programming. Traditionally, Counter-programming was a strategy employed by smaller film studios to compete with larger ones by scheduling their movie releases in close proximity to those of the major studios. Counter-programming serves as an option for individuals uninterested in the larger studios' films, offering them more diverse choices and the opportunity to explore movies from smaller studios. For instance, when major studios release action-packed films, smaller studios may opt for comedy creating a balanced movie-going experience. This strategy can be risky, but it has proven effective for some smaller studios. However, in this instance, the approach differed, as the two major studios within the Big Six decided to employ this tactic to undermine Kishin Pictures' debut film, Jurassic Park Indeed, the films from these prominent studios began to yield profits, diverting the attention of many viewers away from Jurassic Park. In venues like AMC Los Lincoln Square, where Batman Returns was screened, crowds began to gather. Some patrons engaged in discussions with their friends, expressing sentiments like, I had been eagerly anticipating this Batman movie for a long time, and I'm delighted that it's finally showing in cinemas. His friends nodded in agreement, and one of them eagerly responded, Absolutely, it's a great opportunity to finally catch the movie. All the friends nodded and another chimed in, saying, I had originally planned to see Jurassic Park with my girlfriend, but now, with the change in plans, Batman Returns seems like a fantastic choice. The group unanimously nodded as one friend quipped, who would want to watch that ridiculous movie, anyway. True. Everyone nodded in agreement, reaffirming their shared sentiment. Batman Returns hit the screens in the USA, and on its first day of release, it raked in approximately $2 million at the box office. The following day saw a significant surge to $11 million, and by the third day, the film's box office sales had risen to an impressive $16 million in a single day. Regarding Universal Studios' Unforgiven, it also premiered in U.S. cinemas, with an unexpected first-day box office tally of about $4 million. However, over time, the daily box office earnings gradually declined to $2 million. The premiere of Kishin Pictures' Jurassic Park took place at the Uptown Theater in Washington, D.C. on July 18. The film's stars, including Samson Neal, Ricardo Attenborough, and others, along with the influential director Steven Spielberg, were in attendance. They were warmly welcomed by many devoted fans of the Jurassic Park cast. As the actors, directors, and writers arrived in their luxurious cars, they gracefully walked the red carpet. Enthusiastic fans called out, Woo! Samson! Look this way! 
from behind the railing. On the side of the red carpet, stanchions were set up, and the Jurassic Park cast members were visibly thrilled by the crowd's excitement. The gathering appeared to consist of approximately a thousand people. The camera's bright flashes illuminated the Jurassic Park cast as they stood on the red carpet. Behind them, the step and repeat board displayed logos of Kishin Pictures, Savoy Pictures and even Kishin Electronic, positioned right next to the Kishin Pictures emblem. The CBS News interviewer directed his attention to Samson Neal, addressing him, Good evening, Samson Neal. Samson Neal reciprocated the greeting with a nod and a friendly smile. The male interviewer continued, This film, Jurassic Park, is your most significant project to date and as one of the main cast members. How do you feel about it? With a warm smile, Samson Neal replied, I'm incredibly grateful and thrilled. He paused briefly, nodding, and added, I'd like to express my deep gratitude to Kishin Pictures, Steven Spielberg, our director, and the casting director, John Oscar, for giving me this incredible opportunity. Other media outlets interviewers engaged with Laura Dern, a newcomer to the world of acting. The CBS interviewer then posed another question to Samson Neal, stating, Jurassic Park received criticism from many film critics and enthusiasts even before its release. What's your response to these opinions? Samson Neal, seemingly prepared for such a question, nodded and maintained a smile. He replied, I've always believed that one should give Jurassic Park a chance before forming any judgments, and I promise you won't be disappointed. With a reassuring smile and another nod, he concluded, that's all. The CBS interviewer nodded and, after a while, concluded the interview with Samson Neal. He then turned his attention to Steven Spielberg, who had already been interviewed by various media outlets. A female CNN interviewer addressed Spielberg, saying, you are a highly talented director in Hollywood with an esteemed reputation. Jurassic Park was initially seen as a potential failure. Can you explain why you chose to work on a film project with an inexperienced studio lacking prior experience in the film industry? Steven Spielberg remained silent for a moment before responding, there's a saying that we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. My advice is to watch the film Jurassic Park before passing judgment. That's all. With that, he casually made his way into the theater paying little attention to the various media outlets left somewhat bewildered by his departure. Some interviewers from different media outlets exchanged puzzled glances before proceeding to interview other members of the Jurassic Park cast. As the premiere of Jurassic Park got underway, the audience, including film critics invited by Kishin Pictures, settled into their seats in the theater. The film began, and various film critics chose to watch it with the understanding that their reviews would be released after the official nationwide release on July 20. Kishin Pictures had made this offer to prevent spoilers from circulating before the wide screening. Chapter 177, Jurassic Park I At the Uptown Theater in Washington, D.C., the film Jurassic Park had its premiere. The audience engaged in hushed conversations before the start of the film, pondering, I wonder if it will be any good. I've always been fascinated by dinosaurs since childhood, and now, a film about these long extinct creatures graces the film industry. Likewise, I've always been curious about creatures like dinosaurs, which vanished millions of years ago. As they settled into their seats, the audience gazed at the perforated screen, which projected the film Jurassic Park. On the screen, the introduction of Kishin Pictures began. It featured a 2D animation with a child walking while seemingly playing on a Game Boy. The child turned back, causing the letters of Kishin Pictures next to the I in Pictures to fall down. The sound of the letters falling was accompanied by the iconic KRS-1 ringtone, Nokia ringtone, theme. The scene then zoomed out to reveal the child, along with the Kishin Pictures logo, against a white background framed by the black screen. Then the Savoy Pictures introduction swiftly appeared before the screen dimmed. On the screen, the Jurassic Park font emerged, displaying the text, Kishin Pictures and Savoy Pictures presents, followed by an 
Kishin Pictures Production. Subsequently, the singular text Jurassic Park appeared against the black background, accompanied by the theme music. Finally, the film commenced with a nighttime scene where trees and leaves swayed in the wind. The sounds of the wind rustling through the trees, leaves, and the grassland filled the air. A man sporting an orange helmet gazed into the distance. The scene transitioned to the trees and leaves fluttering wildly in the windy night, accompanied by a terrifying sound resembling something treading the ground. Several men wearing orange helmets labeled with Jurassic Park then appeared, with the man in the center seemingly chewing gum. Meanwhile, the audience quietly discussed among themselves, remarking, Could it be the dinosaurs? It's quite eerie, hee <laughs> hee. Julius, accompanied by his friends, watched Jurassic Park with a smile, pondering, it began with scenes that left viewers in suspense, but we all know it's likely going to involve dinosaurs. He chuckled at the thought. The scene shifted back to the same trees and leaves rustling in the windy night, with the unsettling sound of something treading on the ground. Next, a man wearing a brown hat and holding a gun appeared, accompanied by other individuals carrying firearms, all gazing into the distance. These scenes piqued the audience's curiosity and wonder. What were they up against? Why were they armed? Countless questions filled their minds as they continued to watch Jurassic Park with anticipation. The camera then zoomed in on the man wearing a hat. The scene transitioned back to the same trees and leaves swaying, with the rustling leaves and grassland sounds re-emerging. Suddenly, the background was illuminated by lights revealing that the source of the previous terror was actually a vehicle carrying something, as it illuminated its surroundings. The scene then shifted to several people wearing orange helmets labeled with Jurassic Park next to them was a device emitting powerful light, and a voice came over a radio speaker, saying, Everybody, heads up. Keep it clear. The camera zoomed in on the transport cage, which was suspended in midair and then slowly lowered. Stand back. The voice from the speakers commanded as the transport cage came to a halt at a certain position in midair. It seemed about to descend to the ground, but instead, a man exclaimed, Bring it forward, come on. The vehicle proceeded forward with the transport cage at the same level as the platform where several people stood. Another man called out, Slow it down. As the scene continued, text appeared below, reading Isla Nebler followed by another text in the same font and size that read 120 miles west of Costa Rica. The transport cage continued its progression and eventually came to a stop directly above the platform. As the onlookers watched, the transport cage descended onto the ground. Within the apparent transport cage, there was a small window that allowed observation. It seemed to offer the creature's perspective as it looked through the glass accompanied by the growl of what the audience assumed to be a dinosaur. Through the small glass window, one could see people wearing orange helmets, with the man in the brown hat standing in the center. The scene then transitioned, focusing on the man in the brown hat among the group of individuals in orange helmets. He gestured to the team, saying, Pushing team, move in there. Move in. As the scenes progressed, the dialogue continued on your ready. I want tasers on full charge. Steady. Go on. Step back in. Ready, move it!" exclaimed the individuals in the movie as they pushed the transport cage. Well, push! ordered the man in the brown hat, and the men in orange helmets followed his orders. Locked. Loading team, step away! the man in the brown hat commanded. After some time, as one of the individuals climbed onto the transport cage, the man in the brown hat, named Joffrey, instructed, Joffrey, open the gate. However, an unexpected accident occurred as Joffrey, the one tasked with opening the gate, was pushed back to the ground. The transport cage, which had been pushed back, seemed to lurch forward, pushing some people and pulling Joffrey into its interior. Uh -huh. Joffrey screamed as he was being dragged inside. Panic gripped the people, and the man in the brown hat urgently shouted, Block the opening. He added, Don't let her get out. 
They swiftly assisted Joffrey off the ground and pulled him back from the brink of being fully inside the transport cage. However, the man in the brown hat and the others were thrown back as Joffrey continued to be pulled into the transport cage, with almost his entire body inside. The man in the brown hat cried out as he rushed to pull Joffrey back, Somebody, help him. The people gathered around the transport cage, and the man in the hat exclaimed, Hold her back. The armed individuals thrust their weapons through the openings of the transport cage and began attacking the creature inside. Electricity sparked as the scene focused on the creature's head, with the camera zooming in on the creature's eye. It then transitioned to the white man in the hat's face and eyes, before returning to the creature with its terrifying eyes. Shoot her! The scenes continued to change rapidly as the camera centered on the white man's mouth, emphasizing the urgency, shoot her! He uttered slowly. The white man repeated the phrase, shoot her. With the camera still trained on his mouth. The sounds of firearms resonated as the unfortunate man, Joffrey, was pulled inside the transport cage. The audience experienced a mix of emotions as they watched the scene unfold. Some were excited, some were intrigued, while others observed with little reaction. Among them, a guy who had brought his crush to watch Jurassic Park felt lucky as she clung to him, whispering, poor guy. He was probably eaten by a dinosaur. With a sense of pity. The guy was left speechless, and a faint twitch appeared at the corner of his mouth. The scene shifted to a river, where a middle-aged man in formal business attire stood on a floating board while holding a suitcase. Below, the text Mano de Dios Amber Mine appeared as several men, including one shirtless black man, pulled the board with the middle-aged man aboard. The scenes continued with a mustached man sitting on the ground, muttering lines. The middle-aged man eventually landed on the ground after being pulled by the black man, and he exchanged greetings with the white guy. The audience observed as the middle-aged man engaged in conversation with the mustached man wearing a hat. They walked across the rocky terrain, with several people moving about and the audience couldn't help but chuckle when the middle-aged man slipped on a rock. As the scenes continued, Julius, the film critic, watched Jurassic Park and felt that the film held great potential, especially from its opening sequences. Chapter 178, Great CGI In the Uptown Theater, the audience that purchased tickets is enjoying the movie Jurassic Park, along with some members of the media who have been granted permission to watch the film. On the screen, a group of people engaged in mining activities seemed to stumble upon something remarkable. A man with a distinctive mustache approached, crouched down, and carefully held a crystal. He gazed at it and remarked, because Grant is just like me, while studying the crystal. After a brief pause, he continued, he's a digger. As the camera zoomed in, the man's face lit up with excitement as he revealed a mosquito encased within the crystal. The soundtrack intensified, creating a suspenseful atmosphere as the camera zoomed in further. The camera continued to focus on the crystal, revealing an insect trapped within the seemingly impenetrable material. The audience watched as the scenes progressed, with a group of people examining a dinosaur in a desert and analyzing dinosaur bones using a computer. Dr. Grant, during the discussion about the dinosaur, concluded, well, perhaps dinosaurs share more similarities with modern-day birds than reptiles. He pointed to the computer screen displaying the image of dinosaur bones and added, look at the pubic bone, turned backward, just like in a bird. Examine the vertebrae, filled with air sacs and hollow spaces, resembling those of a bird. The camera focused on Dr. Grant as he continued, even the term raptor means bird of prey. As the audience members, who weren't particularly knowledgeable or interested in dinosaurs, watched the film, they unexpectedly picked up some interesting trivia. One of the guys commented, well, that's a piece of trivia I can appreciate, and his friends nodded in agreement. On the screen, following Dr. Grant's perspective, a child's voice piped up, saying, that doesn't seem very scary. Dr. Grant turned his attention toward the source of the voice drawing the audience's gaze as well. The camera revealed a chubby kid who remarked, it looks more like a six-foot turkey. 
Dr. Grant and the blonde woman shared a chuckle, and the audience watching the film couldn't help but join in with their laughter. In the theater, a plump man seated among the audience, munching on popcorn and sipping his coke, grinned at the scene and commented, I agree, kid. Laughter rippled through the audience as some couldn't contain their amusement. Then, on the screen, it appeared that Alan Grant took the comment seriously and decided to both educate and playfully scare the child, while the blonde woman observed with a faint smile and shook her head. As the audience watched these scenes, a woman in the theater whispered to her companion, He's just a kid. Her partner gave a helpless chuckle and replied, A cheeky one, he he. The scenes transitioned, and the blonde woman quipped, Alan, if you wanted to scare the kid, you could have pulled out a gun on him. Dr. Grant shrugged and remarked, Yeah, I know, kids. Before turning to the blonde woman and asking, Do you want to have one of those? The blonde woman responded with a smile, saying, I don't want that kid, but the idea of having a child is intriguing. She added, I mean, what's wrong with kids? They're noisy, messy, and expensive, Dr. Grant casually replied. The blonde woman simply quipped, cheap, cheap. Dr. Grant added, they smell. The blonde woman, named Ellie Sattler, smiled and retorted with a laugh, they don't smell. Dr. Grant immediately countered, some do. Dr. Sattler just laughed in response. As the audience watched, some couples discussed the conversation. A guy who brought his girlfriend along also joined in, with his girlfriend asking, what do you think? The guy simply responded, I agree with that guy, pointing at Dr. Grant. His girlfriend nudged him playfully, leaving him somewhat perplexed. Meanwhile, among the single members of the audience, a man sat quietly, but there's a couple next to him as he munched on popcorn. He muttered, I didn't sign up for this. Then he resigned himself to watching the film Jurassic Park on the screen, a helicopter suddenly approached and landed near the dinosaur remains. Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler exchanged glances before rushing toward the helicopter, which had landed close to the dinosaur site. The careful work Dr. Grant had done to brush off the bones was undone by the blowing sand and dust. Dr. Grant approached the helicopter and gestured for the pilot to shut it down, but the pilot pointed at something, leaving Dr. Grant confused. What? He said. Dr. Grant soon realized as he walked towards a nearby vehicle, which he then opened to reveal a small space resembling a comfortable home. Inside, an old man was seen retrieving something from the refrigerator. Dr. Grant approached the old man and inquired about his identity. The old man introduced himself as John Hammond, causing Dr. Grant to freeze. John Hammond remarked, so I can see that my $50,000 a year has been well spent. Dr. Sattler entered the scene, asking, OK, who's the jerk? Dr. Grant swiftly took control of the situation, introducing Dr. Sattler to John Hammond as if nothing had happened. They shared a chuckle as John Hammond emphasized that he had heard Dr. Sattler calling him a jerk, but Dr. Sattler awkwardly evaded the topic, acting ignorant. Afterward, they had a discussion during which John Hammond invited Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler to a private island. Dr. Grant was initially hesitant but was convinced when John Hammond promised to fund Dr. Grant's research. The film continued as Dr. Grant, Dr. Sattler and a man with glasses approached the island by helicopter. The scenes continued, and the audience watched as dinosaurs were introduced on the island. Wow! Some members of the audience were amazed by the realism, even though it wasn't entirely lifelike. However, the CGI in the film was more advanced and intricate than in any other film with CGI. A few children in the audience were so captivated that they genuinely believed the dinosaurs were real, and their amazement was palpable. Meanwhile, some film critics, like Julius, were impressed by how Kishin Pictures had managed the CGI. They, along with other film critics, had initially doubted whether Jurassic Park could meet CGI expectations, but it appeared they were mistaken. Chapter 179, Thrilling Scene The scenes continued, showing a cow being fed to a dinosaur, 
creating a tense atmosphere as rustling trees and leaves signaled the dinosaur approaching its prey. Dr. Grant, Dr. Sattler, and the onlookers watched in fascination. A scene depicted John Hammond at a table with a group of people who expressed their opposition to the dinosaurs. John Hammond looked at Dr. Grant, expecting him to defend the idea, but Dr. Grant respectfully voiced his own reservations about the dinosaurs. John Hammond was taken aback, as he had invited Dr. Grant to support his vision, only to find that everyone present was against it. The scenes continued, and as the audience watched, a fat scientist appeared to be taking something from a lab, and the system malfunctioned, causing Dr. Grant's car to stop. Dr. Grant glanced at the man beside him, and the confusion among the scientists was evident as they tried to figure out the system failure. Then the focus shifted to the fat man, named Dennis Nedry, who had accepted a bribe to smuggle dinosaur embryos. Following that, a scene on the road unfolded, showing a middle-aged man in a car with children, and Dr. Grant with Ian Malcolm in the car started. The suspenseful scene featured a terrifying dinosaur that had somehow devoured an animal at the side of the road. The children initially realized something was amiss, and Dennis Gennaro also recognized the danger. He spotted the dinosaur's head and made a frantic escape, leaving the children in stunned silence. Dr. Grant and Ian Malcolm were bewildered as for why Dennis Gennaro was running to the public toilet, while Ian Malcolm just thought that Dennis Gennaro have been called by nature as the dinosaur broke through the wire at the side of the road, its foot landing on the road with a menacing roar that left them speechless. Ian Malcolm broke the silence, saying, I hate being right all the time. The audience felt the tension as they heard Dr. Grant advise, keep absolutely still. Its vision is based on movement. Meanwhile, the audience members couldn't help but shiver as the dinosaur moved around the road. This is so eerie. At this point, I'd probably run, just like that cowardly guy. The audience discussed in hushed tones. Then the dinosaur turned its attention to the car where the children were, as a beam of light emanated from it. Dr. Grant muttered urgently and hopefully, turn the light off. Turn the light off. The girl, with a wide eyed look of fear, held the flashlight, while the boy implored, Turn the light off. She hastily directed the light inside the car instead of outside, overwhelmed by panic, and struggled to turn it off immediately. When the boy closed the car door, it captured the dinosaur's attention. Oh, boy. Why did you have to move? A man from the audience couldn't help but exclaim. The audience members didn't reprimand him, instead, they shared the same sentiments as the man. Meanwhile, some of the film critics, including Julius, watched the scene with their hands tightly gripping the armrests of their seats. This is even more thrilling than I expected. Some of the film critics thought in unison. The dinosaur scrutinized the car where the children were. The girl, still holding the flashlight, unwittingly drew the dinosaur's attention, which peered closer through the car's glass window. Oh boy! I can't believe she did that, some people in the audience couldn't help but facepalm themselves. Then the audience members were taken aback as the dinosaur roared at the car with the children inside. Eek! Some of the girls and kids in the audience couldn't help but let out a shriek. Some in the audience closed their eyes, their hearts racing. The audience gasped as the dinosaur used its head to push the car. The kids in the car screamed in fear. Damn it! They should have run with the guy earlier. One of the middle-aged men in the audience exclaimed. The audience couldn't help but silently pray for the safety of the children. In the following scene, the boy approached the girl and urgently said, Turn that off. To the girl who still held the flashlight. Ugh, this girl is so annoying. Why didn't she turn it off? What's wrong with her? One woman in the audience couldn't help but exclaim. Most of the audience members shared the same sentiment as the woman. She's older too, and the boy was much smarter when he was younger. A guy in the audience remarked. The scene showed the girl apologizing to the boy, saying, I'm sorry. Upon hearing her apology, the audience collectively thought, you should be. Their annoyance grew as the flashlight remained on, 
its light piercing the car's transparent window and drawing even more of the dinosaur's attention. In response, some members of the audience facepalmed in frustration. Then, the audience was shocked as the dinosaur shattered the car's transparent window and attacked the kids. Oh no! The audience watched as the dinosaur overturned the car and assaulted it, with Dr. Grant and Ian Malcolm watching in silence, their fear apparent. The dinosaur even pushed its foot into the car, and the children were on the brink of being crushed. Upon seeing Dr. Grant preparing something, it seemed he had a plan, prompting a man in the audience to shout, Dr. Grant, you've got this. Dr. Grant stepped out of the car, holding a lit flare, and attracted the dinosaur's attention by shouting, Hey! The dinosaur roared in response. Dr. Grant maintained its focus on the flare by waving it around before tossing it into the distance. Just as the dinosaur was about to go to the distance where the flare was thrown into, Ian Malcolm, observing Dr. Grant's actions, did the same. Dr. Grant couldn't help but exclaim, Ian, freeze. However, Ian disregarded the advice, which caused the dinosaur, originally heading toward the distance, to turn its attention to Ian Malcolm and pursue him. Ugh, this guy. The audience couldn't help but lament as they witnessed this scene. Then the scene transitioned to the dinosaur approaching where Dennis Gennaro was. The public bathroom was demolished, and the audience witnessed the gruesome scene of the dinosaur devouring Dennis Gennaro. Some audience members shielded the view of the children, as the scene contained violence. The film Jurassic Park continued with its scenes, and the audience watched with their hands tightly gripping their seats. Chapter 180, Box Office Results At the Uptown Theater, the audience watched the film Jurassic Park with mixed emotions. As the story unfolded, they witnessed the demise of characters like the greedy computer programmer Dennis Nedry, creating a roller coaster of feelings. When the film concluded, the audience had diverse reactions, but one thing was clear, they absolutely loved it. Wow, I really enjoyed it, one person said to their friend. Yeah, it's filled with suspense and thrills. I'll definitely come back to watch it again, the friend replied. A CNN reporter who watched the movie also expressed their liking for it. After leaving the cinema, media interviewers approached the audience to gauge their feelings about the film. I loved it. The guy exclaimed with a happy expression. The interviewer asked other audience members, and while some might not have liked it, most either really enjoyed it or loved it. This demonstrates that Jurassic Park had a positive impact on the audience. Following this, the interviewers also spoke with the Jurassic Park cast, who were delighted to share their positive sentiments about the movie. As time passed, the media outlets covered the premiere of Jurassic Park, broadcasting their reports in the news. As people observed the audience's reactions to the film Jurassic Park at the Uptown Theater, they couldn't help but be curious. Simultaneously, they found the responses from the premiere attendees somewhat exaggerated. While watching interviews with the audience, some viewers commented, it seems like Kishin Pictures spent a considerable amount for these people to elicit these exaggerated reactions. Yeah, it does seem a bit over the top, another person nodded in agreement. Why don't we watch the movie ourselves to see if it lives up to the hype? Someone suggested, and everyone agreed to assess whether the audience reactions were genuine or not. Most viewers remained skeptical about Jurassic Park's quality, but a few decided to see the film for themselves. In the meantime, Universal Studios and Warner Brothers, who had their film critics review the movie, appeared rather reserved in their assessment. However, their CEOs and executives maintained a belief that the film might not achieve significant box office earnings. On July 20, 1992, the film Jurassic Park made its debut in 2,870 cinemas. Quickly, a multitude of people flocked to watch it although some harbored doubts as they purchased their tickets. Among them, a group of friends engaged in a discussion. Is the movie really as good as they say? I've heard it is. Yeah, I also heard Batman Returns was quite impressive. It might be a good choice, someone chimed in. 
This group contemplated which movie tickets to purchase when they overheard a nearby discussion. A group of people had managed to secure tickets from the other side. Oh, I really want to see Jurassic Park again. It's fortunate the tickets haven't sold out yet, a girl expressed to her boyfriend, holding on to him. Yeah, we're very fortunate, her boyfriend replied. They were one of the couples who attended the premiere of the Jurassic Park film, and now they were fortunate to secure tickets for another viewing. Upon hearing the couple's conversation, the group of friends exchanged glances. One of them suggested, perhaps we should give Jurassic Park a chance, what do you think? Almost everyone in the group nodded, having just overheard the couple's discussion. While they considered the possibility that the couple might have been influenced by Kishin Pictures, they also acknowledged the chance that the movie might genuinely be worth watching. Following this, they purchased tickets for Jurassic Park soon, they found themselves seated in the theater. Unlike the premiere, the theater was not bustling with as many people, although most seats were occupied, it wasn't completely full. The film Jurassic Park finally began, and the audience eagerly watched. Some had purchased tickets out of sheer curiosity, while a few were attendees of the premiere. Even though these few were already familiar with the plot, they still relished the film as if it were their first viewing. Meanwhile, as the skeptical viewers continued to watch Jurassic Park, their doubts gradually faded as the movie unfolded. The scene where the tour vehicles were menacingly inspected by a T-Rex sent a shiver down their spines. The group of friends, who had initially been doubtful, found their reservations fading as they continued to watch Jurassic Park by the time the movie concluded, they, like the other audience members who had initial doubts, held a blend of emotions. They witnessed the film's end but also felt strongly that the movie was truly outstanding. It had been worth giving it a second chance. Upon exiting the theater, the audience members felt an irresistible urge to purchase tickets and plan to watch it again with their friends. Soon, word of mouth regarding the film Jurassic Park spread among various audiences, friends and families. At the same time, the initial box office performance of Jurassic Park brought some relief to Universal Studios and Warner Brothers. In fact, the first box office earnings for Jurassic Park amounted to only $2.6 million. While it did surpass the first day sales of Batman Returns, it's essential to note that Unforgiven had a significantly lower production budget compared to Jurassic Park which had spent approximately $60 to $70 million on production and several more millions on marketing, including toys, clothing, commercials, and more. That's why some people in Hollywood initially reveled in Kishin Pictures' apparent setback. However, their satisfaction was short-lived as, on the second day, Jurassic Park expanded its screening to about 3,000 cinema theaters. This expansion meant that Kishin Pictures had to invest a substantial amount of additional funds, taking on more financial risk. This decision left the major studios, often referred to as the Big Six, felt Kishin Pictures did a bad move. However, when the final box office figures for Jurassic Park were revealed, totaling at least $15 million, these individuals in Hollywood and the Big Six were taken aback and alarmed by the unexpected success. The impending success of Jurassic Park revealed Kishin Pictures' true potential. What had appeared to be a silent and feeble sheep turned out to be a formidable wolf ready to dominate the scene. As Jurassic Park continued to amass box office returns day by day, it led to a downturn for the films produced by Universal Studios and Warner Brothers, causing them significant financial distress. Chapter 181, First Week Box Office, Praise and Criticism in just a week, the box office results for Jurassic Park shocked many ordinary Americans when it was first revealed on MSNBC. The MSNBC news anchor, with the Jurassic Park logo and title displayed beside him, reported, Have you recently watched a thrilling dinosaur movie that has captivated the attention of many? With a smile, he continued, Let's take a closer look. The scene transitioned to a female reporter in Times Square standing in front of a cinema with a steady stream of people entering and exiting. Holding an MSNBC-branded microphone, she remarked, Today, 
if you ask moviegoers what film they plan to see, their answer is simple, Jurassic Park. The scene then transitioned to a recorded sequence, showing a bustling crowd heading into a cinema about to screen Jurassic Park, with others gradually exiting. The female reporter conducted an interview with one of the individuals leaving the theater, inquiring, what are your thoughts on the movie Jurassic Park? The man turned towards the camera and spoke into the microphone handed to him by the reporter, smiling as he said, it was truly fantastic. I'm considering telling my family to watch it again. The female reporter nodded and inquired, in your opinion, do you believe Jurassic Park deserves the acclaim it's receiving? The man simply nodded and replied, absolutely. Judging from today's turnout, they must be raking in a significant sum at the box office. The female reporter nodded and inquired, how did you first learn about Jurassic Park that prompted you to purchase a ticket? The man replied, I heard about Jurassic Park from a friend. Initially, I had my doubts when buying the ticket, uncertain whether the movie would truly live up to the hype. However, after watching it, I had no regrets. Now, I believe Jurassic Park will become one of my favorites. The female reporter nodded in agreement and added, it's indeed a remarkable film. I watched it myself. By the way, do you happen to know the first week box office earnings of Jurassic Park? The man shook his head and admitted, oh, I wasn't aware. With a smile, the female reporter revealed, the Jurassic Park box office grossed at least $180 million in its first week. Upon hearing the news, the man appeared surprised but then smiled, commenting, oh, I don't find it too shocking, considering how great the movie is when you watch it. The scene transitioned back from the recorded tapes to the live scene with the female reporter standing in front of the cinema. She proceeded to report on the box office performance of Jurassic Park during its first week of nationwide screening. Many viewers at home, who had only heard of Jurassic Park but hadn't seen it, were taken aback by the impressive box office results. In Hollywood, film critics who had reviewed Jurassic Park also made appearances. Various film enthusiasts had read reviews from multiple critics. Julius Thompson from The Washington Post, in his review, described the film as a triumph of technical wizardry and stated that Keishin Pictures and Spielberg have crafted a movie that is both awe-inspiring and terrifying. Peter Ravers of Rolling Stone provided his review of Jurassic Park, describing it as a visual feast that was both exhilarating and terrifying. He also lauded Keishin Pictures for their surprising debut in the film industry and praised the production team and the directorial skills of Steven Spielberg. Owen Gill from Entertainment Weekly shared his perspective, calling Jurassic Park a masterpiece of suspense and wonder. He further noted that Keishin Pictures had created a movie that would entertain and amaze audiences for years to come. Janet Marley of the New York Times hailed Jurassic Park as a triumph of imagination and technology. She commended Keishin Pictures for producing a film that was visually stunning and emotionally resonant. Janet also recognized Steven Spielberg, an already influential figure, for his directorial prowess. Roger Parkinson of the Chicago Times awarded Jurassic Park a perfect 4 out of 4 stars, hailing it as a landmark in the history of special effects and a genuinely scary and thrilling movie. While the list of film critics' praises for Jurassic Park continued, there were also critics who found fault with it. Vincent Kenley of the New York Times wrote a review characterizing the film as a special effects dinosaur movie that leans more on technical achievement than artistic merit. Kenley further criticized the film's script, describing it as a hodgepodge of clichés and banalities. David Anson of Newsweek voiced criticism toward the characters in Jurassic Park, stating, the characters in Jurassic Park are largely one-dimensional cardboard cutouts, either there to be devoured by dinosaurs or to deliver cheesy dialogue. Hal Hinson from The Washington Post criticized the film's pacing, noting, Jurassic Park is a tale of two halves, the first half moves slowly and ploddingly, while the second half is so breathlessly paced that it's difficult to keep up. Despite various criticisms, casual filmgoers chose to overlook the negative reviews and opted to experience Jurassic Park for themselves.
the remarkable box office success of Jurassic Park stirred envy among the big six in Hollywood. The success of Kishin Pictures film Jurassic Park drew the attention of Tora and Suzuki, who also operated film studios in the USA, including Suzuki Pictures Entertainment and Tora Entertainment Creation. These two studios had been in the film industry in Hollywood since 1989, and up to this point, they hadn't achieved the level of success that Kishin Pictures had managed to attain with its debut. Kishin Pictures' incredible accomplishment with Jurassic Park not only sparked envy from Tora and Suzuki but also caught the notice of well-established film studios in the industry. Many of them couldn't help but feel regretful when Savoy Pictures secured the opportunity to distribute Kishin Pictures' Jurassic Park. Some of these studios had been approached by Kishin Pictures but declined, and now, they couldn't help but rue their decisions. Simultaneously, the Suzuki brothers and the vice chairman of the Suzuki Group stood in awe as they witnessed the triumph of Kishin Pictures' debut film, Jurassic Park, in the USA. They were left utterly speechless and couldn't help but be filled with wonder about just how far Shin's luck could take him. Chapter 182, Envious Success Meanwhile, as the buzz surrounding Jurassic Park continued to grow, the weekly box office numbers for films were released. Jurassic Park secured the top spot with a weekly gross of $184 million. Following closely behind, Batman Returns took the second position with a weekly earning of $48 million, and Unforgiven came in at third place with approximately $18 million. MO Money followed with an impressive $17 million in box office revenue, while Honey, I Blew Up managed to bring in around $13 million. The list continued with A Stranger Among Us rounding out the top 10, but it was abundantly clear that Jurassic Park dominated 1992, even in its very first week. Meanwhile, in the midst of Jurassic Park's triumphant run in the United States, Steven Spielberg, the director of the film, reached out to Kishin Pictures to discuss screening Jurassic Park in Brazil first. This suggestion didn't take Shin by surprise as he was already aware that Brazil had the honor of being the first country to screen the film outside the USA even in his previous life. What did catch Shin's attention was Spielberg's willingness to connect Kishin Pictures with the Brazilian film industry. With Spielberg's extensive connections in the Brazilian film scene and the broader Latin American film industry having a strong presence in Brazil, this collaboration offered invaluable support to the budding Kishin Pictures, which was still finding its footing in the film industry. As a result, following Shin's agreement, Kishin Pictures' film Jurassic Park was set to debut in Brazil on August 20, 1992. This early release of Jurassic Park took the Brazilians by surprise, as they were already aware of the film's enormous success in the USA. Time passed with Kishin Pictures achieving remarkable success in the USA, the film had grossed approximately $440 million in just one month. While it was natural for Jurassic Park's box office sales in the USA to gradually decline over time, it still outperformed many other films by maintaining strong sales for an extended period. The international media, including countries like Brazil with a robust film industry, covered the success of Jurassic Park Brazilians, having a deep appreciation for Steven Spielberg's films, especially classics like E.T. or Extraterrestrial, had confidence in his work. Japan, too, acknowledged the success of Jurassic Park since it was produced by the Japanese company Kishin Pictures. South Korea and various Southeast Asian nations also recognized the emergence of the film in the USA. In Europe, word spread about the remarkable box office success of a film called Jurassic Park in the USA. Film distributors from both Asia and Europe reached out to Kishin Pictures with interest in distributing the film. Given that the potential of Jurassic Park in the USA had already been maximized, and Kishin Pictures had profited substantially, Shin believed it was the right time to internationalize their first film and expand its reach overseas. In Asia, film distributors such as Toho in Japan, CJ Entertainment in South Korea, Shaw Brothers in Hong Kong, and PVR Pictures in India expressed interest. In Europe, Notable film distributors included Path and Studio Canal, both based in France, as well as the Telemunchen Group in Germany, Nordisk Film in Scandinavia, 
Entertainment One in the United Kingdom, and more. While these film distributors sought a share of the Jurassic Park box office revenue in their respective countries, Shin saw no issue with considering them as potential financiers for marketing the film in their regions. Kishin Pictures would engage in negotiations to slightly reduce the percentage share, striking a balance that would be acceptable to the film distributors while still ensuring significant earnings for Kishin Pictures. Some of the negotiators representing these film distributors falsely portrayed hesitants, claiming that they were taking significant financial risks by bringing Jurassic Park to their respective countries. Nevertheless, Kishin Pictures remained resolute in their stance regarding the appropriate percentage shares. Consequently, some film distributors found themselves with limited alternatives but to accept the terms. It was nearly certain that Jurassic Park would achieve commercial success. Its earnings in the USA alone were approaching half a billion dollars. This success resonated widely, with audiences in Europe and Asia eagerly anticipating the opportunity to watch the film particularly in Asia, where there was a deep admiration for the USA, a successful American film, coupled with effective marketing by the film distributors, generated significant interest and engagement. Some enthusiasts even purchased Jurassic Park shirts from Kishin merchandise to proudly display their excitement to friends and peers. Kishin merchandise's Jurassic Park products, initially viewed by some as nothing more than a financial burden, were now experiencing a growing surge in popularity, largely attributable to the success of the Jurassic Park film. Sales were skyrocketing to unprecedented heights. Those who had initially mocked the failed products from Kishin merchandise Jurassic Park could only watch in amazement as the merchandise gradually gained popularity. Their astonishment was evident as they witnessed the transformation of these products into a massive success. People with a deep interest in science, technology, and dinosaurs held a profound affection for the Jurassic Park film, even before they had the chance to watch it. As long as it involved science, technology, and dinosaurs, they were already captivated. Similar enthusiasts could be found in the USA, and they were the primary purchasers of Kishin merchandise Jurassic Park. In Japan, on October 3, 1992, Jurassic Park was released, and the overwhelming excitement among the Japanese audience was unmistakable. Tickets were sold out on the very first day, an extraordinary achievement. On that note, Sazama, accompanied by his wife and their security detail, attended a particular cinema theater to enjoy Jurassic Park, which was organized by his youngest grandson's company. As the moviegoers arriving to watch Jurassic Park laid eyes on an elderly gentleman adorned in a kakaji, accompanied by an elderly woman dressed in traditional Japanese attire, along with a retinue of bodyguards in sharp black suits, they were taken aback. Simultaneously, they were hesitant to do anything that might displease such a distinguished individual. The elderly man and woman were shrouded in an air of mystery, with the crowd uncertain whether they were of noble birth important political figures, or wealthy individuals. Regardless of their background, it was clear that provoking their displeasure was not a wise choice. Sazama, clad in Japanese traditional slippers known as Geta, spoke as he strolled along, his footsteps creating a distinct sound as they met the ground. Walking beside him, his wife Kumiko, shared a chuckle as she observed the bustling crowd at the Jurassic Park screening and commented, Look, Kumiko, Jurassic Park from my youngest grandson's subsidiary company has become a resounding success. Upon hearing this, Kumiko, Sazama's wife, couldn't help but chuckle, and with a snort, she remarked, You're excessively proud of your grandson, considering you only recently became aware of his existence on your birthday. Upon hearing Kumiko's playful remark, Sazama blushed slightly and attempted to change the subject. He had arrived at the cinema with his wife, along with a select few bodyguards, while the remainder of the security team kept a watchful eye outside the cinema theater, scanning the surroundings. This situation left the fellow cinemagoers who happened to share the theater with Sazama feeling more vigilant than the actual bodyguards. They had come to the cinema for relaxation, to enjoy a beer, savor some popcorn, and briefly escape the pressures of their daily lives. Unfortunately, 
their luck had them sharing the cinema with the affluent elderly couple. While the global success of Jurassic Park continued to unfold, video game enthusiasts were taken by surprise when Kishin released a Jurassic Park video game in Japan. This strategic move by Kishin didn't go unnoticed by Tora and Suzuki, who were also part of the video game industry. Kishin appeared to be capitalizing on the immense popularity of Jurassic Park by introducing a video game adaptation. In response, the Suzuki brothers, Shiko and Seiki, approached their father seeking approval for a collaborative partnership between Tora and Suzuki to compete with Kishin in the video game industry. Witnessing Chairman Shiro Suzuki's hesitation, Shiko spoke up, saying, Father, even though Shinro is your youngest son, he's still a competitor to the Suzuki group. Seiki chimed in, Exactly, Father. Let's consider this from a business perspective. Personal feelings should not interfere with our business decisions. That's what you've taught us. Hearing these arguments, Chairman Shiro Suzuki found himself in a complex and challenging situation. Chapter 183, Text-Based Game and Kishin's Broader Plan In the headquarters of the Suzuki Group, Chairman Shiro found himself in a discussion with his two sons who had successfully persuaded him to consider entering into a partnership with Tora. Although he was initially reluctant to agree, he couldn't deny the validity of their argument, especially given that his youngest son's company, Kishin, was a direct competitor to Suzuki Group. Reluctantly, Chairman Shiro conveyed his decision to his sons, clasping his hands with a stern expression, I will take your suggestion into account. You may both leave now. Shiro and Seiki exchanged glances upon hearing his words, and after a brief pause, they exited the office. As Chairman Shiro watched his two sons depart, he couldn't help but ponder the complex situation. While these two sons of his shared blood ties with his brother, the vice chairman of the Suzuki group, he had never anticipated that they would align themselves with his brother's interests within the company. Meanwhile, Chairman Shiro genuinely considered his two sons' suggestions but couldn't shake the feeling that his father, Sazama, who held shares in the Suzuki group, should be consulted for his opinion. Not only that, Sazama Suzuki, Chairman Shiro's father, was the founder and former chairman of the Suzuki Group, making his perspective highly significant. The remarkable success of Kishin became evident across various industries, from anime and music to merchandise, the cellular phone industry, and even the film industry. While it was commonplace for Kishin to thrive in Kishin merchandise due to their intellectual property from video games being sold there, the film industry posed a unique challenge. Most expected Kishin to falter if they attempted to adapt their anime or video game intellectual property into films. However, Kishin took a different approach, crafting a story that proved to be a remarkable commercial success in the film industry, with their creation, Jurassic Park, eventually transitioning to the video game industry, mirroring the strategy Kishin employed with Pokemon. Due to the incredible success of Kishin, it garnered the attention of renowned companies like IBM, Apple, Microsoft, Dell, and Intel. IBM, in particular, was contemplating the showcase of their revolutionary Simon personal communicator, which outperformed contemporary cellular phones on multiple fronts. Meanwhile, Microsoft witnessed a gradual rise in sales for its operating system, Windows 3.1. Its impeccable usability in a wide array of applications and software made it exceptionally valuable, especially in a contemporary workspace. Windows for Workgroups 3.11 gained immense popularity in corporate environments. Will Gates, the founder and CEO of Microsoft, was currently engaged in a meeting with the board of directors to strategize and discuss the company's future and its potential for significant success. After exploring the practical applications they could incorporate into their ongoing operating system project, Will Gates broke the silence with a suggestion, esteemed members of the board, as the CEO of Microsoft, I have a long-cherished idea I'd like to propose. The board of directors were taken aback by the formal tone adopted by the founder and CEO, Will Gates. Phil Allen, a childhood friend of Will Gates, regarded him with a touch of surprise. He knew that Will tended to adopt this tone when he had an exceptional idea brewing. 
serving as a member of the board of directors, Phil Allen addressed Will Gates, stating, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts, Mr. Gates, his words and demeanor equally formal. The rest of the board of directors nodded in agreement, indicating their eagerness to hear and consider Will Gates' forthcoming suggestions. With that, Will Gates reached into his pocket, retrieving the KRS-1 phone. He held it up, capturing the attention of the board of directors, and explained, I've drawn inspiration from this device in my hand. Upon hearing this, the board of directors exhibited a mixture of surprise and curiosity. Notably, they all possessed a KRS-1 phone, recognizing it as a standout product within the cellular phone industry. Phil Allen, echoing the collective curiosity, inquired, a cellular phone is your source of inspiration, you say? A question shared by others present. Will Gates nodded affirmatively, remarking, this phone has truly sparked some great ideas for me. He paused briefly, activating his KRS-1 phone, and continued, despite being products of smaller companies like Kishin and Rebold Technology, the KRS-1 undeniably represents innovation not only in the realm of cellular phones but also exerts a subtle influence on other industries. Observing the board of directors not in agreement, Will Gates broke into a smile and added, as you might be aware, the KRS-1 phone boasts a catalogue of games, and that's what inspired me. What if we were to incorporate a selection of games into our operating software? Upon hearing Will Gates' suggestion, the board of directors displayed a mild surprise, though they weren't entirely shocked. After all, Will Gates wasn't the first to propose such an idea, and while he might be the one receiving sole credit for initiating it, they recognized the value of the concept. Their astonishment resurfaced when Will Gates smiled and stated, However, the notion of embedding games in an operating system for computer use isn't groundbreaking. Others before me have made similar suggestions, and it's possible that even Apple is contemplating the same idea. But that's not the core concept I wish to share. As the board of directors absorbed Will Gates' words, they exchanged puzzled glances. They had initially assumed that Will's idea merely involved integrating a list of games into the operating system, but it was clear they had misjudged. Will Gates couldn't help but smile upon seeing the collective surprise on the faces of the board of directors, including that of his childhood friend, Phil Allen. With a sense of anticipation in the room, Will Gates continued, I would like Microsoft to develop a text-based game. He noted the bewildered expressions on the faces of the board of directors, prompting him to clarify, to illustrate, it would be a game displayed solely as lines of text on the computer screen, interacting with the player. The game would rely on the player's imagination because it would consist of nothing but text, and the player could respond by typing on their computer's keyboard. Upon hearing Will Gates' idea, the board of directors couldn't help but feel a sense of disappointment, as their initial expectations waned. Sensing the disappointment in the room, Will Gates sought to address their concerns, saying, programmers could also develop their text-based games using the software we'll provide for creating these kinds of games. He paused briefly before continuing, by doing so, not only would our team have the opportunity, but other programmers could also create their text-based games. Recognizing the need to support his friend in this slightly awkward moment, Phil Allen decided to engage in the conversation, asking, where did you come up with this idea, Will? Will Gates smiled and explained, you know how much I enjoy reading books and novels. It struck me, what if we could interact with a story within a book? It would put your imagination to the test, and for book enthusiasts, this could become an immersive gaming experience. As the board of directors contemplated Will Gates' words, they began to see his suggestion in a more favorable light. While it might not measure up to Kishin's video games, in the realm of computer-based games, it appeared to hold promise. However, their expectations remained somewhat reserved. Little did they know that someone had beaten Will Gates to the punch. Indeed, it was Kishin. While the massive success of the film Jurassic Park had garnered widespread attention, people seemed so captivated by its popularity that they failed to notice Kishin Electronics, led by Shin, quietly orchestrating a collaboration with Apple. 
considering that Apple at this time possessed a net worth of $3.1 billion, most assumed Apple was the more valuable of the two, given that Keishin's net worth remained a well-guarded secret, as it was not a publicly traded company. Yet, within the business world, Industry leaders possessed unofficial estimates of Keishin's net worth, ranging from $6 to $9 billion, including its subsidiaries. This implies that Keishin was indeed a larger company compared to Apple. Steve Jobs found it astonishing that a company established as recently as 1990 could hold such significant worth. Yet, he couldn't overlook the potential benefits of a collaboration with Keishin. Steve Jobs was unaware of Keishin's specific plans for initiating this partnership, but one thing was certain, this was an opportunity. Consequently, in July, Keishin engaged in negotiations and discussions with Apple regarding their potential collaboration. As Steve Jobs perused the plans put forth by Keishin, these proposals were attributed to the young founder and CEO of Keishin, the renowned Shinro Suzuki. Upon reading about the inclusion of text-based games for the Apple operating system, as well as other intriguing Keishin proposals that piqued his interest, Steve Jobs became immediately captivated. While Steve Jobs was undeniably interested in the potential collaboration, the ultimate decision rested with the board of directors. For Steve, this opportunity held the promise of challenging Microsoft's OS dominance, but he knew he would need to persuade the board of directors to agree. As he continued to read, a particularly enticing detail caught his attention, Keishin's willingness to invest in Apple. The prospect of Keishin purchasing Apple shares at a slightly higher price than the stock exchange value nearly swayed Steve to agree immediately. However, Steve Jobs quickly composed himself. He had contemplated selling some of his Apple shares to diversify his investment portfolio, manage personal debts, and support his philanthropic pursuits without entirely divesting his holdings. He was genuinely committed to giving to charitable causes. But now, Keishin was genuinely extending an offer to purchase shares, and Steve Jobs was indeed intrigued. Simultaneously, a few Apple shareholders were contemplating the sale of their shares, and Keishin had discreetly reached out to them, a fact unbeknownst to Steve Jobs. Chapter 184 decision. As Apple and Keishin secretly planned a collaboration, Steve Jobs presented Keishin's idea to the board of directors. Meanwhile, in the Sazama mansion, Shiro and Sazama sat in the room, adhering to traditional customs, with their tea placed on a low Japanese table. Amidst the discussion, Shiro mentioned the Suzuki Group board of directors pressuring him to partner with Tora for a joint venture in developing a video game console. Sazama, sipping his sake, remained silent. Later, Sazama, wearing a stern expression, remarked, I am no longer the current chairman of the Suzuki Group. The decision lies not with me but with you. Therefore, I cannot impose my opinion, he said, gazing at Shiro with a touch of melancholy. Anticipating his father's response, Shiro countered, But, father, even if you are not the current chairman, you still hold a significant share. Your opinion remains crucial. Sazama chuckled and nodded, saying, Indeed, you make a valid point. I can still influence the Suzuki group, but at my age, I've had my time leading the company to great heights. Pausing, he gazed deeply at Shinro Suzuki, stating, Now, it's up to you whether you can lead the company even further. You will be the one to decide. Shiro's expression became complex as he admitted, You know, father, I wouldn't hesitate if Kishin weren't my son's business. But... He paused, looking down, and continued, Kishin is my youngest son's company. If Suzuki Group partners with Tora, it's like ganging up on my own child, beating him with others' help. His tone carried a sense of helplessness. Observing Shiro's predicament, Sazama sympathized with his son, not wanting his youngest grandson to face opposition from others. Despite this, Sazama gently patted Shiro's shoulder, expressing understanding. I can empathize with you, but... He paused, glancing at the sake-filled cup, and continued, From a business perspective, Suzuki Group may not quickly surpass Kishin in the video game industry. 
However, by partnering with Tora, collaborating between two conglomerates for innovative game development, there's a significant chance to deal with and potentially surpass Kishin in a short time. Sazama's voice remained almost emotionless. Shiro, taken aback by his father's words and tone, couldn't help but find it a bit unbelievable. But. He hesitated in his response. Witnessing his son's reluctance, Sazama's eyes and brows sharpened, his overall expression turning serious. Shiro, my son, you should already know not to hesitate when it's crucial for business. I understand the conflict, going against your youngest son's company, but... He paused, emphasizing, even if it means opposing your son's company, you must compete in the best interest of the Suzuki group. Seeing Shiro still unwilling, currently biting his lower lip, Sazama added with a smile, Moreover, consider this a test for your youngest son. Can he stand against two giants joining forces to compete with him, or will he give up? Perhaps. Sazama paused, still smiling, he might be compelled to become a part of the Suzuki group if my youngest grandson fails. Hearing this, Shiro sighed helplessly. Indeed, partnering with Tora to innovate their video game products together seemed like a wise choice. Currently, Kishin almost monopolized the market, leaving Tora and the Suzuki group with mere scraps, not even a soup to drink, but just leftover bones to chew. Inside the Tora headquarters, in the conference room, Asahi Tanaka and the board of directors discussed the plans and the planned portfolio of Tora Corporation. When it finally shifted to the video game sector discussion, Asahi Tanaka remarked, as of now, the Suzuki Group has yet to respond to our proposal for a partnership. The board of directors nodded in agreement, and one executive commented, but it shouldn't be long before they agree, right? In the video games market, both Tora and Suzuki are facing declining sales due to Kishin's SKES and Game Boy, along with their 16-bit video games that have captured the attention of enthusiasts. Another director chimed in, indeed. If we can't halt the decline in our sales, we might be compelled to further reduce the prices of our video game products, which is far from ideal. Asahi Tanaka nodded and remarked, that is correct. Kishin is consistently on the move, continually expanding at an unprecedented rate. In fact, this year, based on our estimates, Kishin's net worth has surged like never before. Their foray into other industries such as merchandise, cellular phones, films, and, notably, their expertise in video games, has led to a gradual profit increase across all the sectors they've ventured into. The board of directors nodded, and one director expressed with a subtle hint of disbelief, that is correct. I find it truly unbelievable. If someone had mentioned a company like Kishin to me before, I would likely have scoffed at the idea. However, Witnessing it in reality is truly stupefying. The executives and Chairman Asahi Tanaka nodded in agreement. Chairman Asahi Tanaka added, Indeed, and to be honest, if Kishin were a public company, I would have invested half of my money in it. The board of directors, upon hearing that, laughed outwardly, but deep inside, they resonated with Chairman Asahi Tanaka's sentiment. They acknowledged that they would likely do the same if Kishin were indeed a public company. Meanwhile, in the Suzuki Group, Chairman Shiro initiated a conference meeting. Before delving into the video games sector discussion, Chairman Shiro, after careful consideration, made the decision to partner with Tora. This choice elicited sighs of relief from the board of directors. Meanwhile, Shonen Jump finally released a new series called Naruto. After being read by numerous manga enthusiasts, they sensed the series had great potential. However, the current reigning manga sensations were Dragon Ball and One Piece. Despite Kishin's engagements in various industries, it also delved into the manga and anime sector. Kishin Entertainment was on the verge of completing the animation for Dragon Ball some episodes. When the trailer for Dragon Ball aired on TV Asahi, manga enthusiasts were thrilled. However, Pokemon fans expressed concern that their anime might be discontinued due to the arrival of the Dragon Ball anime. Kishin reassured them that Pokemon would indeed continue. 
Upon hearing this, Pokemon fans sighed in relief. Simultaneously, they were reassured that Ash's savage roasts of Misty would persist. Chapter 185, Franchise As Kishin distinguishes itself from other ventures, delving into industries such as video games and film, the spotlight particularly shone on its recent success with Jurassic Park. During a Warner Brothers conference meeting, CEO Frank Wilson, who initially underestimated Kishin Pictures, now found himself embarrassed in front of the executives due to the ongoing triumph of Jurassic Park. Witnessing the staggering success of Jurassic Park, even the executives couldn't believe that the relatively new entrant, Kishin Pictures, managed to rake in half a billion at the U.S. box office and achieved global success. Sitting at the helm, Frank Wilson chuckled, cautioning, don't be overly intimidated by Kishin Pictures. They might have struck gold with their first film, but I assure you, they won't stand up to us. Unlike them, we release multiple movies annually. Their Jurassic Park is not something to boast about. Frank Wilson, sounding somewhat reluctant, added, and let's not forget, with franchises like Batman, Looney Tunes, Superman, and Lethal Weapon, we have a track record of consistent commercial success that surpasses Kishin Pictures and their Jurassic Park. Upon hearing this, the executives nodded in agreement. One of them remarked, Indeed. Moreover, whether Kishin Pictures can establish another film franchise remains uncertain. In consensus, everyone nodded, and another executive added, Hee hee, I believe Kishin Pictures might just rely on Jurassic Park for a few years. However, a dissenting voice emerged, I disagree. Kishin Pictures' parent company, Kishin Electronics, possesses numerous intellectual properties like Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda, and Pokemon, among others. As this information sank in, the executives and CEO Frank Wilson fell into a momentary silence. Frank Wilson shook his head, expressing his doubt, I don't think Kishin Pictures will leverage their IPS in films. There's a chance but one misstep with a poorly made movie based on their video game IPS could negatively impact the sales of their video games. The executives collectively nodded in agreement upon hearing the statement. One executive chimed in, true, but Kishin is under the control of a young man, essentially just a kid. He has the freedom to pursue unconventional ideas. Pausing, he continued, however, Shinro Suzuki should exercise some sanity especially in the realm of films. While the concept of adapting video games to films is intriguing, it carries the risk of turning into a tragic endeavor. While some executives nodded in concurrence, others still harbored reservations. Meanwhile, Universal Studio remained unperturbed by Kishin Pictures' Jurassic Park with a plethora of equally renowned franchises such as Extraterrestrial or E.T., Jaws, Back to the Future, The Terminator, and more, most of their franchises, akin to Kishin Pictures' Jurassic Park, revolved around science and technology. By mid-October, Jurassic Park had achieved global fame, especially in the United States. Capitalizing on this, Kishin Pictures collaborated with McDonald's to distribute mini Jurassic Park toys and a special Jurassic Park food edition, quickly becoming a sensation among Americans. The iconic Alan Grant hats gained popularity as Jurassic Park merchandise became a trend among the populace. Buoyed by the franchise's success, Shin embarked on the ambitious project of creating a real-life Jurassic Park intended to be Kishin Pictures' flagship attraction, akin to Disneyland from Walt Disney Pictures. However, Shin was not content with relying solely on Jurassic Park being opportunistic and possessing knowledge of the future he recognized both similarities and significant differences between this world and his previous one. While SKES and Game Boy had established themselves in the video games market for several months, they were still unavailable in Europe. Contrary to popular belief, SKES and Game Boy had not yet seen a global release. Thanks to Kishin's robust connections with retail distributors in North America and Asia, an early release in these regions became possible. However, Countries like Brazil, Australia, and the United Kingdom continued to rely on KES and 8-bit video games. 
This discrepancy was attributed to stricter regulatory hurdles and regulations on video games in these countries, causing delays in the SKES release. Additionally, marketing considerations prompted Kishin to deliberately prolong the release in these regions, fostering excitement and anticipation among local video game enthusiasts. Presently, Kishin's video game enthusiasts in the United Kingdom are limited to watching Jurassic Park produced by Kishin Pictures. The delay in releasing SKES and Game Boy in the United Kingdom has frustrated fans to the brink of madness. Some have gone to the extent of traveling abroad, particularly to the USA, to purchase these gaming consoles. Despite the high cost, they deemed it a worthy investment, mirroring the actions of video game enthusiasts from other countries. However, Kishin was actively engaged in negotiations with retail distributors in the United Kingdom to bring SKES and Game Boy to the market. In the case of Australia, Kishin had to modify the SKES to comply with safety standards. In Brazil, where the country was grappling with a recession, selling the relatively expensive SKES and Game Boy posed challenges for Kishin in securing distributors. Hence, although Kishin video games gained recognition, it was limited to specific countries. Even in Asia, where some could afford it, there remained a sizable population unable to do so. Consequently, some resorted to pirated video game consoles and games. In response, on October 28, 1992, Kishin Electronics decided to significantly slash the prices of KES and video games, despite having already reduced them. This move prompted a surge in SKES and video game purchases, further contributing to the decline of Tora and Suzuki video game consoles and sales. This strategic pricing maneuver continued to tighten Kishin's grip on the video game industry. Adding to the pressure, on November 1, 1992, news of the Tora and Suzuki partnership surfaced in Japan, capturing widespread attention. The partnership between these two conglomerates for video game innovation truly astonished many. It was hard for people to believe that Kishin, a company worth less than both conglomerates individually, could compel them to join forces and unite against it in the video game industry. Chapter 186, Preparation The partnership between Tora and Suzuki caught the attention of Kishin executives. While some had mixed reactions, Shin, indifferent to opinions, prioritizes a meeting with Myra before heading to North America to meet Steve Jobs. Shin has also tasked Oreo Masayoshi with managing negotiations between Apple shareholders interested in selling their shares to Kishin. The allure of Kishin acquiring shares at a slightly higher price than the stock exchange value is enticing, especially given Microsoft's growing dominance in operating systems, causing Apple's stock price to plummet. Outside Kishin's building in the parking lot, Shin strolled toward his Porsche 959, entered the car, and drove off. As his car glided onto the road, numerous onlookers couldn't help but admire its exterior. Smiling, Shin headed to the Mejuro neighborhood in Toshima Ward, home to Kakushuan University where Myra is currently studying. When Shin's opulent car graced the university entrance, the surroundings were already buzzing with activity. Observers couldn't hide their curiosity at the sight of the luxurious vehicle. Unfazed, Shin stepped out of the car to find Myra. Spotting her waving from a distance, he smiled, approached her, and took her hand. Amid the glances from onlookers, Shin couldn't ignore the subtle disdain in their expressions. It seemed they assumed Myra, with her bulging stomach, was involved with a wealthy man. A woman wearing thick makeup and red lipstick snorted, remarking to her friend, Look, someone's already secured a future. Her friend nodded and shared her opinion. Some people quietly discussed among themselves, aware that Shin and Myra were still present. They maintained a subtle and silent tone, considerate enough not to let Shin and Myra overhear their conversation, making it seem like a private exchange. Sensing the crowd's judgment, Shin furrowed his brows and remarked, I told you that you could study at home. Now many people will think poorly of you. Myra smiled kindly and responded, Come on we already discussed this. Besides, why should you care about others' opinions anyway? 
Shin felt helpless as he sighed. Holding Myra's hand, he walked to the Porsche 959 and simply said, I just care for you. Myra chuckled as they entered the car, don't worry about me. Besides, you still have a business to attend to. She paused, noticing a newspaper on the side of the seat. Picking it up, she read the contents and saw a photo of the chairman of Suzuki Group and Tora Corporation chairman shaking hands, accompanied by the headline, Suzuki Group and Tora Corporation, the two largest conglomerates, join forces in video game innovation. The article then elaborates on the collaboration between Tora and Suzuki, featuring a reporter's question to Chairman Asahi of Tora Corporation, by joining forces in video game innovation with Suzuki Group, are you confident that the two companies can surpass Kishin in terms of video game console performance and game creation? Myra furrowed her brows upon reading this. Chairman Asahi's response caught her attention, we possess extensive research capabilities, making video game console performance a non-issue. In terms of electronics, Tora and Suzuki have more expertise than Kishin Electronics. We only lag behind Kishin in video game creativity. However, through the joint partnership, the creative teams of both companies will collaborate, and you can expect our companies to produce exceptionally well-made video games. That's all I can say. As Myra read this, she glanced at Shin, who was currently driving the car. She asked, the partnership between Tora and Suzuki seems quite alarming. Aren't you worried? Shin chuckled while steering the wheel, why would I be worried? He paused, glancing slightly at Myra, and continued, after all, in terms of electronics and video game advancement, we already have a clear plan laid out in our portfolio. Besides, Tora and Suzuki are unaware that Kishin is on the verge of venturing into computers for now. With the developments of the 32-bit era that Kishin is preparing, it marks the beginning of the 32-bit era, 64-bit era, and 3D era. That's why Shin has already initiated the development of a game engine. Myra gazed at the confident Shin and smiled, perhaps this is why she liked Shin so much his confidence and commitment to his words. Meanwhile, on November 9, 1992, in the USA, Las Vegas, Nevada, at Comdex, IBM left many attendees bewildered. Why? They unveiled a product called Angler, an 8.5 inches high, 2.75 inches wide, and 1.75 inches thick device. The person introducing the device explained its features to a media reporter covering the advanced technological gadget. As the people were bewildered, their curiosity and interest grew as they examined the Angler device. The presenter demonstrated its touchscreen capabilities, interacting with the screen using a stylus. Not only was it a cellular phone capable of making calls and sending messages, but it also featured a calendar and more. Angler doubled as a handheld fax machine, allowing users to send and receive faxes. Despite its multi-functionality, IBM acknowledged that it was merely a prototype and not the finalized product. The people felt a sense of regret, had they known the price and if it were affordable, they would have eagerly embraced such a device. Simultaneously, they acknowledged that its size surpassed that of the KRS-1 phone, making it less pocket-friendly. However, the functions of the Angler alone were compelling enough to pique their interest. Meanwhile, IBM, having observed the game's list on the KRS-1 phone, decided to incorporate a list of games into their finished product, the Simon Personal Communicator. The research for the Simon Personal Communicator accelerated, thanks to the involvement of a Japanese company named Mitsubishi as the hardware manufacturer. Japanese companies, known for their prowess in electronics, demonstrated their capabilities at Comdex. Suzuki Electronics, for instance, showcased their latest electronic products, including televisions and speakers. Top 3, the first chapter will be released at the usual time of midnight plus 08 GMT, followed by the second chapter at 12 o'clock plus 08 GMT and the third chapter at 1800 hours plus 08 GMT. Top 2, the first chapter will be released at midnight plus 08 GMT, the second chapter at 6 o'clock plus 08 GMT, 
and the third chapter at 12 o'clock plus 08 GMT. Top 1, the first chapter will be released at the usual time of midnight plus 08 GMT, while the second and third chapters will each be released within a one minute interval. In summary, for the top 3, following the first chapter, the second chapter will be released after 12 hours, and the third chapter will follow in 6 hours. Regarding the top 2, after the release of the first chapter, each subsequent chapter will be released every 6 hours. As for the top 1, it will follow the usual schedule. After the first chapter, each subsequent chapter will be released after a 1 minute interval. Chapter 187, Meeting Revolt Technology took note of the Angler announcement at Comdex, and CEO Albert Chandler, learning about it from friends who attended the event, became intrigued by the advanced features of Angler. The functions and features seemed so impressive that one couldn't help but wonder if they were exaggerated. However, given that it was IBM, there was no exaggeration. Meanwhile, Shin had already arrived at the airport, ready to travel to the USA to meet the legendary Steve Jobs from his past life. Despite recognizing that the Steve Jobs in this world is a parallel figure from his previous one, and acknowledging potential differences, Shin couldn't help but think, Steve Jobs is Steve Jobs. Even though, in his previous life, Steve Jobs had been fired from Apple in 1985 before returning in 1997, in this world, that event either hadn't occurred yet or might not happen at all. Indeed, in this world, Steve Jobs also founded Apple and serves as its CEO, so the difference won't be too significant. A few months after the release of SKES and Game Boy, both consoles being open platforms, independent video game companies, existing for about a year, were elated. Kishin provided the video game development kit, enabling them to create their first games for SKES and Game Boy. Companies like Kuma Games, Seabed, Shin Roads, etc., stepped in to fill the void in video games for SKES and Game Boy. As Kishin only released a limited number of games for these platforms, it couldn't satisfy the market for several months. Independent game companies played a crucial role, providing quality games that resonated with players, causing Tora and Suzuki to struggle in the competitive video game industry. Video games from independent companies, like Warrior of Dawn with impressive graphics and gameplay from Kuma Games, gained popularity among players. Man's Eat from Seabed, another independent video game company, featured a storyline about a man consistently devouring food from his boss's restaurant. The gameplay involved preventing the man from being caught by his boss, a concept that captured everyone's attention. For casual players, this type of video game resonated well. Typically, casual players favored games like Tetris and Super Mario Bros. all products of Kishin. However, Seabed's Man's Eat stood out with its unique gameplay appealing to casual players of all ages. While the Shin Roads company drew inspiration from the name of Kishin's founder, the group of game developers were fervent fans of Shinro Suzuki. They crafted video games like Corny Boogie, with a storyline revolving around a kid sent underground or to hell by a group of Yakuza possessed by demons due to his corny jokes. The snotty kid, donning a hat and constantly cracking jokes, navigated through side-scrolling levels and puzzles, capturing players' attention. Situated on Mariani Avenue in Cupertino, California, is Apple headquarters. Shin, who has been in the United States for two days now, drove his rented car to the front of Apple's building. He parked the car in the expansive parking lot just in front of the building. As he walked towards the front, Shin observed the Apple Loop campus building. It was truly massive prompting Shin to reflect on his Kishin main headquarters, recently purchased in Toshima Ward, and still about two years away from completion. In terms of appearance, Kishin headquarters couldn't compete with the current grandeur of the Apple Loop campus. The aesthetic appeal was striking, with numerous cars parked in the lot just in front of the Apple building, likely belonging to Apple's employees or executives. Several people were walking around and entering the building. Shin took out his KRS-One phone and dialed the number of Steve Jobs, provided by Oreo Masayoshi. 
The ringtone of the KRS-1 phone echoed before being answered, and a man's voice greeted, Hello. Shin smiled upon hearing it and promptly responded, Mr. Jobs, it's me, Shinro Suzuki. In the Apple CEO's office, Steve Jobs heard the young man's voice. The introduction caught him slightly off guard, yet there was a hint of excitement in his reaction. Despite Shinro Suzuki being much younger than him, that young man managed to revive the video game industry, propelling it to greater heights within just a year or two. Additionally, the companies owned by this young entrepreneur consistently generated profits despite being private. This fact truly intrigued Steve Jobs, making him wonder. One thing was certain the young man proved to be a remarkable businessman and innovator in the video game industry, earning admiration from many. With that, Steve Jobs smiled and remarked, Oh, it's Mr. Suzuki. It's an honor to be called by you. He awaited a response as his KRS-1 phone sounded. Haha, the honor should be mine, Shin continued on the other side, saying, I really appreciate your Apple products. Upon hearing that, Steve Jobs laughed and added, I also enjoyed playing on SKES and Game Boy, my son was even fascinated with Pokemon. Upon hearing Steve Jobs' flattering words, Shin couldn't help but smile wryly. From what he remembered, Steve Jobs' son should have been born in 1991, so Shin remarked with a smile, a one-year-old liking Pokemon. The phone fell silent for a moment, followed by the laughter of Steve Jobs. Then, on the other end of the line, Steve Jobs said, Ha ha ha, you got me. Steve Jobs had intended to reciprocate the compliment but was surprised that Shinro Suzuki knew his son was only a year old. Nonetheless, he continued, even though he's just a year old, he really liked Pokemon. When I presented a Pikachu on his birthday, he absolutely loved it. Steve Jobs couldn't help but explain. Steve Jobs then perceived that Shinro Suzuki appeared to believe him. Shinro Suzuki proceeded to inform him that he was actually outside the Apple Loop campus building, near the front and the parking lot. Upon hearing this, Steve Jobs promptly stood up in his office and glanced out of the windows. However, due to the crowd and numerous cars in the parking lot, he couldn't spot Shinro Suzuki. Upon Steve Jobs informing Shinro Suzuki that he was looking out the window, he noticed a young man with black hair waving his hand while holding a phone. As a result, Steve Jobs spotted Shinro Suzuki approaching the building. Several people walking around couldn't help but look at Shinro Suzuki who was waving his hand. Following that, Steve Jobs proceeded to exit the building and welcomed Shinro Suzuki to the Apple campus. Employees observed as the CEO greeted an Asian young man entering the premises. Subsequently, Shin and Steve Jobs walked to the CEO's office to discuss the potential partnership between Kishin and Apple. Chapter 188, Apple and Kishin Alliance in the CEO's office at Apple, Steve Jobs and Shin discussed the potential partnership between Kishin and Apple. After a while, Steve Jobs asked Shin, why do you want to partner with our company? He paused and continued, Kishin is clearly focused on video game consoles and games, whereas Apple is more focused on computers, software and operating systems. We're centered on different aspects and I don't see why Kishin would assist us in competing with Microsoft in the operating system realm. Shin smiled as he sipped the black coffee Steve Jobs had provided. Honestly, he didn't like black coffee, but since Steve Jobs appeared to be a minimalist, Shin refrained from complaining. He then said, although Kishin and Apple specialize in different areas, they share similarities. He paused, observing the furrowed brows of Steve Jobs, and continued, for instance, Apple's quick draw development, I believe it would be crucial for the programs Kishin is developing. Quick draw, being a graphics API, has been immensely helpful for our Kishin employees in video game creation. Yes, we used Apple's Macintosh for game development. There are various reasons, but in essence, the video game and computer software industries are interconnected, as video games wouldn't be possible without them. Shin explained in a series of words. Steve Jobs nodded in agreement with what Shin had said, I can see that. 
the proposal from Kishin involving 2D games, text-based games, and joint research on computers, GPU, and quick draw in terms of research, Kishin would likely benefit the most. In my opinion, your company doesn't have much expertise in computer, software, and GPU development. Kishin might not contribute much to the joint research, and that's why I am hesitant about whether to agree or not. Shin nodded in understanding and replied, Certainly, Kishin wouldn't be the sole beneficiary. Apple would also gain from the joint research with Kishin. Shin smiled, noticing the confusion on Steve Jobs' face, as if prompting him to continue. Shin added, I can inform you that Kishin has expertise in CPU and GPU technologies. Though we're still catching up with established companies in these fields, we do possess some expertise. Steve Jobs was quite astonished when he heard that and remarked, Kishin is developing its own CPU and GPU. Seeing Shin nod, Steve Jobs couldn't help but chuckle as he continued, Don't tell me Kishin is planning to enter the computer industry. Though he said this in a light tone, he was actually quite vigilant. After all, if Kishin intended to partner with Apple, they might seek Apple's expertise in these computer technologies to enhance their own capabilities and potentially enter the computer industry. Steve Jobs' vigilance wasn't unfounded. Given that Kishin was expanding into industries beyond video games, it would be reasonable to suspect that they might genuinely aim to enter the computer industry using the knowledge gained through collaboration with Apple. In Steve Jobs' view, Kishin seemed to be leveraging proposals related to video games and ideas for a partnership with Apple as a means to engage in joint research and acquire crucial expertise. Although Shin appeared to be sipping the black coffee, he was secretly observing Steve Jobs' expression. He noticed Steve Jobs' eyes briefly turning vigilant before returning to normal. With a smile, Shin said, entering the computer industry was indeed tempting, but no. Kishin isn't planning to compete in the computer industry. We're planning to compete in. Shin paused and continued, the processor market. Steve Jobs felt a bit relieved upon hearing that Shin didn't plan to enter the computer industry, which Apple currently focuses its business on. However, he wasn't entirely sure whether to trust Kishin. The proof of Kishin's developments in CPU and GPU technologies was uncertain. Moreover, CPU research was time-consuming and expensive, requiring a team of engineers, scientists, and access to manufacturing facilities. Even for Apple, developing their own CPU was inconvenient, leading Steve Jobs to doubt whether Shinro Suzuki was telling the truth. Sensing Steve Jobs' lingering skepticism, Shin delivered a final point, stating, Not only that, but Kishin also specializes in cellular phone technologies. Kishin and Apple could collaborate on joint research for cellular phone developments. When Steve Jobs heard that, he paused, setting down his Pinot Noir wine. He was astonished that Shinro Suzuki proposed a joint research for their cellular phones. To be completely honest, Steve Jobs had been quite interested in the cellular phone industry. However, given that Apple was primarily focused on computer and software development, and lacked sufficient funds to venture into the cellular phone industry, as their funds were allocated for the development of computers, software, and operating systems. But now, the founder and CEO of Kishin was voluntarily offering them an opportunity to acquire cellular phone technologies through a potential joint research between Kishin and Apple. Steve Jobs believed Kishin had expertise in cellular phone development, especially considering that he was currently using the KRS-1 phone. With that, Shin and Steve Jobs delved deeper into the potential partnership between Kishin and Apple. Now, with Shin proposing a joint research initiative on cellular phones, Steve Jobs was almost convinced. Even if Kishin planned to enter the computer industry, he found genuine interest in the Kishin and Apple alliance, particularly due to the joint research on cellular phones. Alliances between American companies and Japanese or other Asian companies weren't uncommon, IBM, for instance, was currently in alliance with Mitsubishi. While Shin and Steve Jobs were in discussion, Steve Jobs remained unaware that Kishin was covertly acquiring shares from significant stakeholders. Even if Steve Jobs were to disagree with the partnership, 
Kishin and Apple would still be bound in an alliance. Oreo Masayoshi, along with individuals entrusted by Shin to approach Apple stakeholders for share acquisition, is currently engaged in a tender offer. This process is being carried out without the CEO's awareness, as the stakeholders discreetly sell their shares. Big and small stakeholders have already initiated discussions regarding the acquisition of their shares by Kishin. Oreo Masayoshi and the team encountered some challenges negotiating with the larger stakeholders, but a few agreed, leading to Kishin successfully acquiring their shares. Some of these stakeholders even held positions on the board of directors, potentially altering the composition of the board. Now holding a significant stake of 7.2%, Kishin has the potential to influence the board of directors. This influence is likely to grow, considering that Kishin is still in negotiations with other stakeholders. Chapter 189, Pixar Animation Project In December, various US media outlets reported on the Kishin Apple Alliance. Upon learning of this news, companies had mixed reactions. Microsoft, for instance, was aware of the Kishin Apple Alliance as early as November. Around the same time, news of the Tora Suzuki Alliance in the video game sector also reached Americans. Excitement grew among ordinary American video game players who enjoyed both Tora and Suzuki consoles. Meanwhile, the Jurassic Park domestic box office in the USA reached an impressive $632 million and the international box office soared to a whopping $341 million, continuing its ascent. As the domestic box office for Jurassic Park experienced a gradual decline, Kishin reduced the number of screening cinemas from 3,000 to 1,209. This decision was driven by a decrease in box office profits, although tickets were still selling, though not at the same rate as before. On the international front, the scenario differed. Instead of declining, the international box office saw a gradual rise. The widespread distribution of Jurassic Park to various countries contributed to this increase, fueled by the global hype surrounding the film. Given the immense popularity of Jurassic Park, Amblin Entertainment, founded by Steven Spielberg, expressed interest in collaborating with Kishin on the sequels of the film and future joint ventures in filmmaking. Shin Finding no issues with this proposal, had Kishin Pictures enter into a collaboration with Amblin Entertainment. Shin, recognizing the talented directors at Amblin Entertainment, aimed to harness their skills for his envisioned future film projects, particularly those tied to his previous life's movies. Amid the establishment of the Kishin Apple Alliance, Shin recalled Pixar, the company behind Toy Story, the fully animated computer feature film. While still in the USA, Shin contemplated the idea and decided to call Steve Jobs to inquire about the animation project. Using his KRS-One phone, Shin dialed Steve Jobs and asked, Mr. Jobs, is Pixar currently working on any animation projects? At that moment, Steve Jobs exclaimed, So you've caught wind of the animation project Pixar is working on. Shin smiled in relief realizing that Pixar in this world was indeed creating Toy Story. He then inquired, Haha, being a shareholder of Apple now, can you share the name of the animation project? Steve Jobs didn't find it surprising that Shin was aware of Pixar's animation project, especially considering its significant scale. Steve Jobs simply replied, Indeed, Pixar's animation project is titled The Toy's Life Story. Upon hearing the name, Shin couldn't help but smile at the project's title. Although it seemed unlikely for Steve Jobs to endorse such a name, Shin understood that it might not be the final name for the animation project. Noticing Shin's silence, Steve Jobs added, Let me assure you, this animation project is unlike anything before. It's poised to change the world. Steve Jobs chuckled and exaggerated, anticipating that Shin might find his statement hard to believe. Unbeknownst to Steve Jobs, Shin simply smiled and genuinely believed in what he had just heard. Having originated from a parallel world, not vastly different but closely resembling the current one, Shin expressed to Steve Jobs, I can contribute to Pixar's animation project. 
I have a subsidiary company specializing in computer-generated imagery and a motion capture company, if collaboration with Pixar is possible. Upon hearing Shin's proposal, Steve Jobs hesitated momentarily. However, Considering the potential acceleration of the project and Shinro Suzuki's significant stake in Apple, he saw no major issues. Given Steve Jobs' occasional clashes with Pixar's creative team, he agreed, saying, I'll agree under certain conditions. Shin smiled and inquired, Oh, what is it? Steve Jobs replied, I want your key Shin company to refrain from exerting excessive influence or control over my plans for Apple. Additionally, if I require some support, I need assurance that you'll provide it. Upon hearing these conditions, Shin couldn't help but remark, Mr. Jobs, these conditions seem quite demanding for a mere collaboration between my companies and Pixar. He paused, noting Steve Jobs' evident silence, and continued, However, if you expect me to agree to such terms, then you should propose a corresponding price for the conditions you've set. Holding his phone to his ear, Steve Jobs fell silent in contemplation before suggesting, I'll offer you one-third of my Pixar shares, approximately 16%. How does that sound? Upon hearing this, Shin remained silent. While surprised by Steve Jobs' unexpected offer, Shin recognized that complying with the condition not to influence or control Apple contradicted his own vision. He didn't find the proposed share allocation sufficient, considering his own plans for Apple. Shin responded, Can shares from such a modest company truly sway me into relinquishing my influence over you and Apple? Upon hearing Shin's skepticism, Steve Jobs anticipated the resistance and proposed, I'll offer you half of my Pixar shares, amounting to 24%. All I ask is for you to ease your influence on Apple and support me in the board of directors through your proxy and directors elected from Key Shin when required. He hoped Shin would find this offer agreeable. However, he faced disappointment as Shin replied, It's quite impossible for me to entirely relinquish my limited control and influence in Apple, but I'm prepared to offer my support. What do you think? Upon hearing Shin's response, Steve Jobs, having expected it to some extent, simply said, All right. While he couldn't entirely prevent Ki Shin's potential influence in the company, he found reassurance in Shin's commitment to support him. Steve Jobs continued, I'll draft a contract for this agreement, and the collaboration between your companies and Pixar will commence. My Pixar shares will also be transferred to you, with the condition that you support my ideas in the board of directors. Shin smiled and replied, All right. Steve Jobs felt he had made a wise decision, especially considering that Shinro Suzuki's company, Kishin, currently owned 15% of the shares, equivalent to 465 million. As time passed, digital CGI and ASC motion capture companies collaborated with Pixar, contributing to the progress of the animation project. Later, when Shin visited Pixar and discussed the project with the creative team, he suggested naming the animation Toy Story. Initially, the creative team expected Shinro Suzuki, as a major shareholder, to assert dominance and influence like Steve Jobs. However, they were pleasantly surprised to find that Shinro simply wanted the animation to be named Toy Story. Additionally, Shin requested that his key Shin companies be featured in the animation film, a request the creative team readily accepted. Chapter 190, Forward Meanwhile in Japan, TV Asahi finally premiered the anime Dragon Ball, garnering widespread attention. Consequently, a surge in interest led to an increase in the manga's sales. A similar phenomenon occurred with One Piece and Naruto, captivating manga enthusiasts. Simultaneously in South Korea, Manwan emerged victorious in the presidential election. As January approached, Kishin faced delays in releasing their highly anticipated video game products like SKES and Game Boy. With the administration that faced strong animosity from Japan, South Korea targeted Kishin. While other Japanese companies like Tora, Suzuki, Toyota, and Mitsubishi were unaffected by South Korea's actions due to their stronger political standing, Kishin, lacking political influence in South Korea, 
found itself in a vulnerable position. Despite protests from video game enthusiasts eager to experience Kishin's latest products in the South Korean market, the company faced an obstacle. Kishin, in response, informed the South Korean gaming community that political and diplomatic tensions between South Korea and Japan hindered the release of their products in the region. This news left South Korean video game fans disheartened. The older generation, witnessing the support for a Japanese company by the younger generation, felt a sense of disgust. They admonished their children and the younger populace. By January, the situation escalated, leading to the ban of Kishin in South Korea. Meanwhile, in Japan, at the Kishin headquarters, Shin, upon learning of the ban in South Korea, couldn't help but sigh in disappointment. South Korea's market was undeniably lucrative. Yet with the ban in effect, Kishin received inquiries from Samstar Electronics and Hyun Motors regarding the distribution of Kishin video game consoles. Recognizing that Kishin was now prohibited in South Korea, both Samstar Electronics and Hyun Motors extended their hands to facilitate the potential release of Kishin SKES and Game Boy under their respective company banners. In a conference room, Shin, accompanied by executives and Han Lee, who had just returned from Taiwan, wore a serious expression as they delved into discussions on this matter. In their current deliberations, they faced the decision of selecting a company for product distribution in South Korea. Amidst the discussion, Han Lee unexpectedly spoke, suggesting, Mr. Suzuki, I must advocate for Samstar. While their offers may appear less favorable than Hyun Motors, their significant influence and strong brand presence in South Korea could offset this. Choosing Samstar might mean sacrificing a bit of profit, but the partnership could still be lucrative, establishing a valuable connection. Moreover, the disparity in the conditions proposed by Samstar and Hyun Motors is minimal. Shin, Myra, and the executives regarded Lee Han with a hint of surprise. Meanwhile, Shin, stroking his chin, remarked, you have a point. Partnering with Samstar could also establish connections. Observing Shin's subtle decision, Myra, Li Han, and the executives acknowledged that Kishin had opted to partner with Samstar. Simultaneously, Kishin wasn't the sole entity grappling with this dilemma. Tora and Suzuki, while their companies weren't entirely banned in South Korea, allowing them to sell products like cellular phones, cars, and TVs faced a ban on their video game consoles and games within the country. In response, they received offers from other South Korean chable companies. After a few days had passed, with Samstar joining forces with Kishin and Hyun Motors facing rejection, they proposed a partnership between the Tora Suzuki Alliance. Ultimately, Hyun Motors secured a partnership with Suzuki, while the Lucky Gold Group teamed up with Tora. Meanwhile, South Korean video game fans initially expressed frustration over Kishin's ban. Their mood briefly lifted upon learning that Samstar would distribute SKES and Game Boy under its banner. However, their excitement turned to anger again upon realizing that the release date was set a few months in the future. It was taking an extended period, prompting some South Korean video game fans who could afford it to fly to Japan just to purchase Kishin SKES and Game Boy. Meanwhile, in the United Kingdom, on January 8, 1993, a crowd of mostly young British people gathered outside a Kishin store, eagerly anticipating the release of SKES and Game Boy in about a week. A frustrated British young man commented as he surveyed the long line, Bloody hell, I thought the release of Kishin's latest products would be one of the most exciting things to happen in my life, but this line is killing me. I agree, buddy. A middle-aged man echoed the young man's sentiment. You should be planning to buy SKES and Game Boy 2. Which video games are you quite interested in? The young man, realizing there's no use in complaining, decided to initiate a conversation with the middle-aged man. The middle-aged man chuckled as he replied, I'll only buy a Game Boy, and the video game I'm highly anticipating is Tetris. Upon hearing this, the young man felt speechless but chose not to reprimand the middle-aged man, considering his old age. However, from the young man's perspective, 
Kishin had far more interesting video games to offer than just Tetris. In response, he proceeded to inform the middle-aged man about the captivating video games that Kishin had released this year. Following Kishin's release in the United Kingdom, France, and various countries in Europe, the release extended to Australia. As the release of Kishin's latest products continued in other countries, the company also launched a new video game, Earthbound, which thrilled Japanese players who had become fans of the earlier Earthbound beginning. Shortly after, Earthbound was released in the United States. Matt, a devoted fan of this video game series, hastily made his way to the Kishin physical store to purchase the new installment. His excitement and joy were palpable, given Kishin's release of a new Earthbound video game following Earthbound beginning. Chapter 191, Earthbound Before the launch of Earthbound, Kishin decided to introduce their own magazine, titled Kishin's Power. The magazine featured compelling and helpful insights into Kishin video games, making it particularly interesting for players like Matt. When Matt spotted the latest issue of Kishin's Power, highlighting the new video game Earthbound, he eagerly grabbed a copy. Upon obtaining Earthbound, Matt promptly headed home and inserted it into his SKES cartridge slot. Having enjoyed Earthbound beginnings, Matt found the video game captivating. He appreciated the game's uniqueness, both in terms of storyline and gameplay. In Earthbound Beginnings, the initial segment featured the in-game character battling a lamp, an eccentric choice that contributed to its limited popularity in the United States. While Celeste gained some traction, it couldn't compete with the dominance of Super Mario and The Legend of Zelda in the market. Transitioning to Earthbound, Matt loaded the game into his SKES. The Kishin logo appeared and he eagerly observed as the introduction to the Earthbound video game unfolded. The experience commenced with statistics screens tinged in red, revealing an image of a UFO assaulting a city. At the top, the text read Earthbound, while bold red letters below declared the war against Gigas. The accompanying sounds heightened the anticipation, and Matt was already feeling the excitement. The image of UFOs wreaking havoc on a city transitioned seamlessly into the video game title Earthbound, accompanied by a lively sound theme. Soon after, a cheerful music theme played as the video game title transformed into a small circle set against a black background. Inside the circle, three kids strolled through a vibrant street. Subsequent scenes unfolded within the circle, showcasing the kids interacting with an elderly person, a bus traversing a road the kids threading along a lakeside, a descent down seemingly ancient stairs, and a kid with a hat riding a bike. The upbeat music continued, and Matt began to sense that the video game promised a joyous adventure for the kids. Within the small circle, set against the black background, the scene shifted. The kids now traversed a desert, with the kid in the hat leading, followed by a person with yellow hair and glasses. They arrived at a gathering of people surrounding someone on the ground. The kid with the hat and the person with yellow hair and glasses encountered a woman with matching yellow hair. The scenes then transitioned to the kid with the hat wandering in a dark forest, accompanied by the text inside the circle that read, Kishin Presents. The transition seamlessly led into the Earthbound video game title. New game options emerged, and Matt selected the first option for a new game. He then adjusted the text speed, opting for the fast setting. The game also presented a choice for sound settings stereo or mono. Matt decided on stereo. Following that, he encountered an option for window style. As Matt scrolled through the styles, the window border color changed accordingly. Opting for simplicity, Matt selected the plain flavor window style. Moving on to character naming, he chose the I don't care option resulting in the default name Ness for the boy with the hat. This process was repeated for the other character names. And so, Earthbound unfolded as the city appeared in the night, accompanied by text on a black background stating, Wanat, a small town in Eagle Land. The scenes then transitioned to a house, with white text against a black background identifying it as Ness's house. In a room, a boy peacefully slept on a bed until the house suddenly shook jolting him awake. Rising from the bed, 
the boy stood up, signaling the commencement of the Earthbound video game. Taking control of his in-game character named Ness, Matt observed that the Earthbound introduction bore a resemblance to certain TV series, leaving him impressed. As he delved into playing the game, Matt guided Ness to investigate the source of the earthquake. Engrossed in Earthbound for a few minutes, Matt found himself completely invested. The storyline proved to be both interesting and entertaining, with the mystery unfolding as he progressed through the game. However, after playing for hours, Matt became somewhat annoyed when his in-game character, followed by others, would abruptly halt whenever the photographer appeared to take a picture. The flow of Matt's gameplay was further interrupted when Ness's father called to inquire about how his in-game character was faring. Fortunately, Matt had opted for the fast text speed option. As he continued playing, he began to discern that Earthbound had a darker tone compared to the preceding Earthbound beginnings. After a while, Matt felt tired playing and started to save the game by calling Ness's father. However, Matt still experienced the extended storytelling from Ness's father, further delaying the process of saving the video game. Meanwhile, with the release of Earthbound, Shin was also planning the production for an animated series of Earthbound A Dream from Shin's previous life. He consistently believed that Earthbound warranted an animated series. The video game's storyline was genuinely captivating, deserving a visual adaptation. Multiple Kishin Animation Studios collaborated to bring the animated series of Earthbound to life. Whether it becomes popular or not, Shin doesn't care, he simply yearns to witness the creation of an animated series for the exceptional video game Earthbound. Following this, Shin contemplated initiating a video game project inspired by Earthbound The Future Undertale. However, Shin pondered its potential popularity among video game players at this time, taking into account the limitations of the 16-bit era. Even if Shin managed to adapt Celeste for the 16-bit, it would entail compromising graphics and compressing memory-intensive levels. This would inevitably diminish the gameplay experience for video game players. Therefore, Shin has already set his company, Kishin, on the path of developing the next generation of 16-bit, even before the SKES and Game Boy hit the market. While Shin is uncertain whether he has surpassed Tora and Suzuki in terms of video game console research, he remains confident in his ability to release the next generation. This confidence persists, even if Tora and Suzuki do not introduce their own video game consoles for Kishin to reverse engineer. Chapter 192 Kishin Acquisition of Apple Shares Shin and Steve Jobs engaged in a lengthy discussion before Steve expressed, let me take some time to consider this with the board of directors. Shin nodded, saying, no problem. He was confident that Steve Jobs would agree. Even if he didn't, the shares Kishin was acquiring would soon astonish Steve Jobs, as some Apple shareholders had already sold their shares to Kishin. This strategic plan was Shin's decision, the only way to ensure Kishin could secure a partnership with Apple. Considering Apple's future success, Shin would be foolish not to seize the opportunity to acquire its shares when he had the chance. While Steve Jobs was voluntarily selling some shares to Shin, Shin happily agreed with the conditions set by Steve Jobs as he bought the shares. As time passed, Steve Jobs, who discussed the alliance with Kishin with the board of directors, initially thought he might encounter disagreement. Surprisingly, there was no opposition at all, gradually making Steve Jobs feel that something was amiss. Unbeknownst to Steve Jobs, some Apple shareholders had already traded their shares through brokers or intermediaries, transferring their assets to Kishin. By doing this, shareholders didn't need to report to the company that they had sold their shares. Consequently, CEO Steve Jobs remained unaware of Kishin's successful acquisition of Apple shares. However, some of the Apple board of directors, who are friends with the few shareholders that sold their stakes to Kishin, are aware of the situation as they were informed by their friends. During the conference meeting, Steve Jobs noticed the absence of Mr. Wright and Mr. Goodman, along with some other board members. With furrowed brows, Steve Jobs inquired, where are Mr. Wright and Mr. Goodman, and some other board members? 
they usually attend crucial board of directors meetings. Why are they not here today? Some of the board of directors exchanged dismayed glances. Steve Jobs, noting this, furrowed his brows, his expression silently posing a question. Subsequently, one of the board members addressed Steve Jobs, saying, Mr. Jobs, you may not be aware, but Mr. Wright, Mr. Goodman and the others have already sold off their shares. According to the company's bylaws, they are no longer eligible to be part of the board since they no longer hold any shares in the company. Steve Jobs' eyes widened slightly as he sought confirmation from the other board members, who nodded in agreement. Upon witnessing this, Steve Jobs couldn't help but be astonished and exclaimed, Really? They sold off their shares without me, the CEO, knowing. The board of directors maintained silence before one member solemnly disclosed, not only that, dozens of stakeholders have also sold their shares to a single entity. Upon hearing this revelation, Steve Jobs and a few board members were quite shocked. Steve Jobs inquired, they sold their shares to one entity. Some of the board members who were aware of the situation nodded in confirmation. Then, with a frown, Steve Jobs inquired, what entity is it? The few board members were equally eager to know. After all, if this entity had acquired a significant number of shares, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that it would wield substantial influence over the company. Some of the board members exchanged glances, and then one of them, sighing, revealed, it was Keishin Electronics. Upon hearing this, Steve Jobs and the few board members were visibly shocked. Steve Jobs exclaimed, Keishin. In disbelief. Some of the board members nodded, and one of them affirmed, yes. In fact, they indeed acquired Apple shares, and while it may not be a single entity, it can be regarded as such. Steve Jobs and the few board members wore confused expressions, prompting Steve Jobs to inquire, what do you mean? Some of the board members exchanged glances, and one of them nodded, explaining, some stakes that Apple stakeholders traded were directed to Keishin subsidiaries, such as Keishin Merchandise or Keishin Entertainment Music. Though under different names, these Keishin subsidiaries could acquire Apple stakes. In essence, despite being subsidiaries, they still fell under the overall influence of Keishin, making it essentially one entity. He paused and added, in short, while these are Keishin subsidiaries, they are still considered part of the larger Keishin entity. Upon hearing this, Steve Jobs and the few board members gained clarity. With a calm expression, Steve Jobs remarked, I see. Pausing, he continued, no wonder some of you didn't oppose the alliance of Keishin and Apple this time. He couldn't help but chuckle wryly as he glanced at the board members who were already aware of the situation. Simultaneously, Steve Jobs recalled the face and the initial meeting with the young man, Shinro Suzuki. Initially, he believed the young man to be genuine, but now, he couldn't shake the feeling that Shinro Suzuki was particularly cunning. The fact that he even sold a portion of shares to Shinro Suzuki only heightened his influence in Apple. Now, Steve Jobs couldn't help but be concerned. His control over his company was already slipping due to demanding shareholders, and now, another significant entity had acquired a substantial amount of Apple shares. Steve Jobs couldn't help but massage his forehead as he forced himself to calm down. He couldn't help but think, maybe I need to meditate later. Meditation would indeed help him in this moment. At this time, there's no need to worry about things, for Steve Jobs, everything will fall into place sooner or later. He wanted everything to flow naturally, like water in a river. Steve Jobs just hoped that Keishin would not influence the board of directors to remove him from office, as he was keen on planning for the company's success, even amid struggles with Microsoft. Shin, currently relaxing at a beach with Oreo Masayoshi and a few individuals who were the brokers that helped him acquire the Apple stakes, found them unwinding with him. Some of these brokers even introduced their partners to him, an offer Shin declined. While Shin thought, what's wrong with these people? They're kind enough to share. Disgusting. Simultaneously, 
he understood their excitement, having gained substantial amounts of money by assisting Kishin in acquiring Apple shares. Basking under the sun and observing people playing volleyball and enjoying the sea, Shin occasionally admired women in bikinis. However, he will not to pursue any romantic involvement with them. Shin's phone rang, and he answered it to find Steve Jobs on the line. Shin smiled as Steve Jobs informed him of the success of the alliance between Kishin and Apple. Although Steve Jobs didn't explicitly mention Kishin acquiring shares, he congratulated Shin and abruptly ended the call without waiting for Shin's response. Shin couldn't help but chuckle wryly, thinking, he should have known by now. Chapter 193, Development Undertale drew inspiration from Earthbound, a project Shin fully committed to. Progress in 32-bit research was boosted through joint efforts with three Silicon Valley companies Shin had invested in. Apple's involvement expanded Kishin's research facilities, attracting several other companies to contribute to ongoing projects. Simultaneously, the game engine project was in progress. Given the absence of an existing game engine at the time, Shin and fellow developers had to build everything from the ground up, crafting their tools and framework a time-consuming endeavor. One pivotal figure in the development of Kishin's game engine was Andrew Reed, specifically selected for this significant and confidential project by Kishin. Andrew, a highly intelligent recent graduate from Harvard, was thrilled to contribute to the company led by the visionary behind the video game industry's revival Kishin. Upon presenting his qualifications, Andrew was promptly accepted. A few months into his tenure at Kishin, he was chosen for a particular project that left him truly amazed. The project, named Unreal Engine, a game engine development project, originated from the mind of Shinro Suzuki. Upon delving into the project's concept, Andrew was captivated by Shinro Suzuki's visionary plan and ideas. The full realization of the game engine promised to significantly streamline the process of video game development. With this development, Andrew pondered whether there would be any competition left in the video game industry. Kishin, Tora, and Suzuki stood as the industry's top companies, while others attempted to enter with unique consoles. Despite their efforts, None could rival even Tora and Suzuki, yet they still profited. Notably, independent game companies emerged, reaping substantial benefits with Kishin's support. Approaching February, Tora and Suzuki observed the success of independent games on Kishin's platforms. Consequently, both companies opened their platforms to these independent developers. Most independent game companies, prioritizing profits, chose to make their games, initially exclusive to Kishin platforms, available on Tora and Suzuki platforms as well, seemingly without concern for Kishin's reaction. However, certain independent video game companies displayed loyalty to Kishin by maintaining exclusivity on Kishin platforms. Upon noticing this, Kishin's leadership decided to extend more favorable offers to these particular independent game developers. Meanwhile, in February, a month meant for celebration for the Suzuki couple, Shiro and Eri, due to Valentine's Day and their shared birth month. Shiro, aged 52 with a birthday on February 8, and Eri, aged 49 with a birthday on February 1, were supposed to enjoy festivities in the Grand Suzuki household. However, an unusual silence permeated the Suzuki family's dinner table. Reina, who pouted while eating her steak, snorted, I didn't realize that Shinro having a child was such a big deal. Shiro and Eri furrowed their brows at Reina, who, upon noticing their reaction, fell into silence. However, Shiko and Seiki shared the same sentiment as Reina. Shiro and Eri exchanged glances, and then Shiro spoke, this is indeed a significant event. He paused glancing at his two sons and two daughters before continuing, your mother and I are going to be grandparents, and you four will finally have a nephew or niece and become uncles and aunties. Shiro beamed with a huge smile on his face as he spoke. As Ruki, Reina, Shiko and Seiki sensed their father Shiro's imminent wide smile, they were left momentarily speechless by his words. In particular, Reina retorted, declaring, no way. 
I refuse to be called an auntie. Shiro and Eri chuckled at her protest and simply laughed. Meanwhile, in Sazama Suzuki's mansion, Sazama and Kumiko were equally thrilled about their impending great-grandchild. The rest of the Suzuki family received news that Shiro's youngest son was expecting a child with his wife. This prompted various reactions within the family, though not overly pronounced. As Japan entered the year 1993, the preceding year, 1992, witnessed a decline in childbirth in the country, although it wasn't deemed particularly alarming. The decline in childbirth in Japan stemmed from several factors. Speculations in the Japanese media suggested that the cost of raising children, coupled with the overall high cost of living, contributed to this trend. Additionally, many young individuals were seen prioritizing their careers or engaging in entertainment, such as films, the burgeoning popularity of anime, and video games. However, opinions on the role of entertainment in this decline varied, and it remained a matter of speculation. Even in the 1970s and throughout the 1980s, Japan had been grappling with low childbirth rates. In response, the government had implemented various regulations aimed at boosting childbirth in the country. Meanwhile, in Shin's grand household, he observed as the doctor conducted a checkup on Myra. The female doctor reassured Shin that Myra was in good health. Leveraging his wealth, Shin had brought medical equipment to a private room in his house where the doctors examined the baby in Myra's stomach. Shin felt a mix of excitement and anxiety, contemplating whether Myra would navigate the pregnancy successfully and what would unfold during the delivery. Overwhelmed with thoughts, he even prayed to God for a smooth process. Expressing his concerns to Myra in the presence of the female doctor, she chuckled and said, Don't worry too much, Shin. She paused, glancing at Shin's private parts, and added, I am already used to it. So, I think I'll do just fine. Shin furrowed his brows, and the female doctor chuckled, noticing the playful meaning behind Myra's words. When Shin finally grasped it, he blushed, prompting both women to burst into laughter. Shin found a reason to exit the private room. As he closed the door, the constant laughter of Myra and the female doctor lingered in his ears. Shin shook his head simultaneously feeling less worried, reassured by Myra's comforting words. Just then, his phone rang, and Shin noticed his father calling. Upon answering, Shiro inquired about Myra's pregnancy. Shortly after, Myra's parents, Daichi and Miku, also called. Shin provided reassurance, and Myra's parents expressed their intention to visit and check on their daughter. Shin didn't find anything wrong with it and agreed. Simultaneously, Shin's parents were also planning to come and visit shortly. Chapter 194, Shinichi In Myra's room, Shiro and Eri paid a visit, inquiring about her current health. You should take care, eat healthy foods, and look after the baby, Eri advised Myra. Shiro echoed similar sentiments. As time passed, while Shiro and Eri conversed with Myra, Sazama, and Kumiko, Shin's grandparents, also came to visit. Alongside Shiro and Eri, Sazama and Kumiko engaged in conversation while Shin sat beside Myra. After a while, Shiro, Eri, Sazama and Kumiko bid farewell. Shin stayed with Myra before heading to the company to check on the progress of their project development. The progress in game engine development had advanced sufficiently for Shin to embark on the development of Doom. Apple's support coupled with early access to their operating system for Kishin, proved instrumental. The system also showcased a slight advantage over the current market. Kishin successfully developed an early game engine prototype, closely resembling the Doom engine. That's why Shin, along with a group of key individuals, gradually developed a Doom video game for Shin's past life. Although it appeared 3D, it wasn't truly 3D but it was 1993, and technology had its limitations. Kishin's video game was set to release for Apple's System 7. In Shin's past life, Doom was released for MS-DOS by Microsoft. Meanwhile, in the United States of America, 
as Microsoft was working on video games and text-based applications for their operating system, on February 11, 1993, the founder and CEO Will Gates, along with executives, were astonished to discover that Apple had just integrated video games and text-based games into their operating system. Upon witnessing this, Will Gates suspected that someone had leaked their company's plans to Apple. However, one executive refuted this, stating that Apple was ahead in developing video games and text-based applications for their operating system compared to Microsoft. Considering that creating text-based games was more challenging than it appeared, prone to errors and complications, Apple had indeed outpaced Microsoft in this aspect of development. Simultaneously, Will Gates and others at Microsoft were left speechless, contemplating the unlikely scenario of both Microsoft and Apple independently working on the same project without mutual knowledge. Simultaneously, given the alliance between Keyshin and Apple, Will Gates and others speculated that Keyshin, a video game company with a prominent presence in the USA, played a key role in leading the development of these features. As Apple released their video games and text-based games, promoting them as products resulting from the collaboration with Keyshin, fans of both Keyshin and video games eagerly purchased Apple computers. However, given that Apple was relatively expensive during this period, only a fraction of the video game fans could afford it. Ray belonged to this group, he purchased an Apple computer enticed by the prospect of video games, fueled by his curiosity. Upon powering up the Apple computer, he initially encountered only solitaire, chess, and poker. Feeling like he might have wasted his money, Ray's sentiment changed when he discovered Tetris and some other simple video games, providing him with at least a few options to enjoy. As he delved into the text-based games, particularly trying an adventure text-based game, Ray became thoroughly engrossed in reading the unfolding story. The vivid descriptions of his character exploring the world created an experience akin to reading a novel, yet with the unique twist that he could shape the destiny of his character through choices. Simultaneously, a 2D pixelated image of his character emerged in a forest, appearing as he typed commands on the keyboard to interact with the text-based game. Ray couldn't help but acknowledge the intriguing concept of text-based games. While it felt like immersing himself in a novel or story, the interactive element, where players controlled and made choices for the main character, added a layer of engagement that surpassed traditional reading experiences. Ray wasn't the sole enthusiast captivated by these text-based games, others who supported Apple or were avid video game fans shared his enthusiasm. Meanwhile, on February 13, 1993, Myra successfully conceived a baby boy. Shin, filled with excitement, entered the room where Myra lay on the bed cradling their newborn. Shin felt an overwhelming mix of disbelief and joy in that moment. Shin approached Myra, gently caressing her hair. Observing Myra's fatigued expression, Shin softly uttered, Rest well. Nodding, Myra handed the baby to Shin. As he cradled the newborn, Shin examined the baby's face closely, rendered momentarily speechless. While the female doctor inwardly likened the baby to a newborn monkey, Shin found the baby irresistibly cute. In the meantime, Myra gazed at Shin with a smile, suggesting, So, if it's a boy, should we name him Shinichi or Shuto? Shin drifted into thought for a moment before snapping out of his reverie. Dear, I still think Naruto or Luffy would be great names. Myra and the nearby female doctor chuckled upon hearing Shin's suggestion. Amused, Myra responded, Oh, dear. You need to stop reading that manga Naruto, you're poking fun at our child. Shin, with furrowed brows, persisted with another suggestion. How about Conan? Myra smiled and said, No. Observing the disappointment on Shin's face, she chuckled and added, But I thought Shinichi, the name you suggested, was quite good, don't you think? Myra found Shin's naming suggestions occasionally eccentric. Shin sighed and reluctantly nodded, saying, All right. Perhaps he had inherited his parents' unconventional naming sense from his previous life. The naming of math algebra had been the source of his misery in his past life. Bullied for his name, he developed a submissive personality, 
catering excessively to others. Fortunately, as Shinro Suzuki now, the influence of his previous life gradually diminished, and he transformed into a confident and assertive young man. Meanwhile, Shiro and Eri, Shin's parents, entered Myra's room, both gazing at the baby. Myra's parents also visited after some time, and everyone admired the adorable baby. However, Minji, expressing her own opinion, felt the baby resembled a monkey. Yet, upon voicing this thought, she faced a reprimand from her parents. Minji apologized while Myra chuckled at her little sister's predicament. However, deep inside, Minji couldn't help but feel envious of her big sister, who already had a wealthy husband and a child, while she remained single. Chapter 195, Tsuki Since Myra's pregnancy around early June, Shin hasn't had sex for quite a while now, and he's been feeling the built-up lust. However, since Myra was still recovering, he distracted himself by taking care of their baby. Afterward, he would immerse himself in work. But when he caught a glimpse of his employee's sexy body, Shin immediately shook his head and immersed himself in coding on his computer instead. Why do men have to be like this? Shin thought as he continuously tapped into his computer. No matter what, he would not resort to cheating, he is a man. After completing his programming for the game engine, he took out a Bible and started reading. While tempted by evil, he would read the Bible or sometimes novels to quell the malevolent thoughts in his mind, recognizing their potential for harm. As he immersed himself in reading, his phone rang, and he noticed it was the Yakuza leader, Obu. Shin frowned, and surprisingly, Obu also celebrated the birth of his son. Truth be told, while Shin grappled with handling this group of criminals with mental problems, he could perceive that these people genuinely liked serving him overall, evident in their sincere joy at his son's birth. Is this how Kim Jong-un feels? Shin pondered, sensing a parallel with dictators worshipped by their people and military. He was also informed by Obu about his elder sister, Reina, being involved with a Yakuza gang and having a boyfriend named Ken Shin. Upon learning of this, Shin asserted, deal with that guy if he does anything to my sister, and Obu dutifully followed his orders. No matter how spoiled his elder sister Reina was, there's a saying that blood is thicker than water. Shin still cared for his siblings, no matter how poorly they treated him, after all, they were family. While the Kishin Apple gained some recognition in the United States of America, the Tora Suzuki Alliance shouldn't be forgotten. On February 24, 1993, they launched their own handheld video game console in the Japanese market. It was named the Tsuki Handheld, differing from the Game Boy. It featured a slightly rounded shape, and the screen followed this curvature, with controls positioned beneath the small screen. The screen itself was slightly larger than that of the Game Boy. The cartridge slot was situated on its back, similar to the Game Boy. Even if Kishin were to sue Tora and Suzuki, the Tsuki boasted distinct hardware and a different architectural design on its board. The overall design also differed from that of the Game Boy. This is Tora and Suzuki's approach. In their imitations, they ensured that even if Kishin sued them, they were confident they hadn't violated copyright law due to the subtle differences between the two products. So, even if Kishin fans worldwide were annoyed about why Kishin wasn't pursuing legal action, there's no point for Kishin in doing so. Not only would it be a waste of money, but Kishin would not ultimately prevail in the end. Following the release of the Tsuki, there was a limited video game lineup for the handheld. The anime featuring both Tora and Suzuki, centered around mechs and technology, was also adapted into video games. Moreover, they introduced a Pong video game, allowing two players to engage in a battle with Pong. Although an old video game from the 60s, it was enhanced by Tora and Suzuki. Tora and Suzuki also introduced a video game reminiscent of Pokemon, though not exactly Pokemon itself. It revolved around collecting mechs, with mech battles being the primary gameplay. Additionally, they released several Tora and Suzuki video game sequels exclusively playable on Tsuki. 
With these developments, Tora and Suzuki fans, who had been experiencing an all-time low as the Kishin dominated the market, found newfound happiness. The dwindling community also regained its vitality. This is a comeback! exclaimed a Tora fan. Ha ha ha, Game Boy is doomed, Tsuki will dominate Japan! proclaimed a devoted Suzuki fan. Interestingly, some of these Tora and Suzuki fans were scavengers of video games. A few among them possessed a masochistic inclination towards enjoying what some might consider trash video games. They willingly devoted their lives to playing these games, and while some Tora and Suzuki games had bugs, these masochistic enthusiasts played them wholeheartedly, unaffected by the glitches. These scavengers, in particular, didn't seek societal help, and that's precisely why they identified as Tora and Suzuki fans. The flawlessly crafted video games with minimal bugs from Kishin didn't inspire or interest them in the least. If Shin were to discover the existence of this group of people, he probably wouldn't believe it even if he were slapped to death. Who would dislike good video games, anyway? These unconventional individuals do. With the release of Tsuki, the battle between Tora, Suzuki and Kishin in the video game community across several arcades was initiated. With Tsuki boasting a superior color palette, impressive sound speakers, and a more ergonomic design for comfortable holding compared to the blocky shape of Kishin's Game Boy. Game Boy? Or a piece of block? A Suzuki fan grinned as he observed a Kishin fan holding a Game Boy. The sales for Tsuki on its first day were quite high. While it didn't reach the same level as Kishin's Game Boy, it was a significant achievement for Tora and Suzuki, especially considering the long period during which they hadn't seen any profits in the video game industry. Additionally, Tora and Suzuki embraced collaboration with independent game developers, allowing them to create and develop their own video games for the Tsuki handheld console. Independent video game companies are growing each day, fueled by the rising popularity of video games. Those who once doubted the future of video games now find themselves looking up, as the video game industry has become a driving force for Japan's declining economy, providing crucial support. Despite the overall video game industry's inability to fully counteract Japan's economic decline due to recession, it remains a significant asset in contributing to Japan's economic well-being. Chapter 196 Time skipped. With the launch of Tsuki, Tora and Suzuki witnessed a surge in their video game sales. Tsuki was consistently compared to Game Boy. While Game Boy boasts the popular Pokemon video game, Tora and Suzuki introduced a game with similar gameplay. This enabled them to attract individuals who enjoyed the Pokemon gaming experience. The video game created by Tora and Suzuki was named Mecho Battle focusing on collecting mechs rather than magical creatures. Additionally, they produced an animation for this game. Despite these efforts, Tora and Suzuki faced tough competition against Game Boy and Pokemon. However, they couldn't quite match the sales of Kishin Game Boy and its video games. However, Tora and Suzuki maintained silence as they worked on developing their own 32-bit video game console, concurrently advancing their video game development. Simultaneously, they launched new video games for their 16-bit consoles and introduced a console capable of running Tora and Suzuki's 16-bit video games. As a result, the sales of their video games soared with the introduction of the Tora key 16-bit video game consoles. Priced more affordably than SKES, Tora key became a budget-friendly choice for many gamers. Tora Key represented an improved version of Tora and Suzuki's 16-bit video game consoles, leading to a surge in players enjoying Tora and Suzuki video games. Meanwhile, Kishin captured attention by releasing games like Killer Instinct, Super Mario Kart, Actraizer, and Yoshi Island for SKES. Despite this, Tora and Suzuki remained composed, planning to stun Kishin with the later development of their video game consoles. Through joint research, the two companies anticipated completing the console development in approximately three to four years. The joint partnership of Tora and Suzuki allowed pooling resources, making research finances more efficient. Simultaneously, 
with the rising popularity and substantial profits in the video game industry, it expanded into the computer sector. Apple and Microsoft began incorporating video games into their operating systems. Recognizing the potential of developing video games for computers, various companies initiated efforts in computer game development. Meanwhile, Shin's investment in the World Wide Web is beginning to demonstrate its potential, with several companies starting to utilize the domain. Web browsers also benefited from the gradual rise of the World Wide Web. Although the sites were only text based, it was still a positive indication of the initial stages of the World Wide Web's ascent, and Shin's investment didn't go to waste. As time passed, June arrived, and Shin received a message from Yakuza leader Obu, informing him that they had successfully taken control of the Yakuza gang behind Ken Shin. Shin couldn't help but be speechless, a few months ago, he had merely suggested dealing with Ken Shin, and now they had conquered an entire gang. Although it took a few months, Shin found it quite unbelievable. However, Shin chose to overlook that development as the release of the TV animated series of Earthbound was on the horizon. TV Asahi unveiled two anime trailers, both under Kishin Earthbound and Yu-Gi-Oh! The anime industry experienced growth following Kishin's success. Dragon Ball garnered widespread acclaim and was on the verge of being released in other countries. As a result, other animation studios began adapting manga into anime, generating substantial profits. Some achieved significant financial gains, while others faced losses due to poorly animated content or less engaging storylines. Meanwhile, in the competition with the Apple operating system, Microsoft launched their own video game on MS-DOS featuring 16-bit graphics and a side-scrolling gameplay. They also introduced a word puzzle and other intriguing video games for MS-DOS, effectively enticing customers away from Apple who were considering purchasing their computers primarily for the video games in their operating system. In response, Apple executives convened to discuss the situation, leading Steve Jobs to call Shin and inform him about Microsoft's strategic moves. Key Shin Headquarters Shin sensed that it was time to soon release their video game Doom, which had been developed using the prototype game engine currently under development at Kishin. In their phone conversation, Shin remarked to Steve Jobs, It seems I have to release the video game that will be the breakthrough in the gaming industry. Upon hearing this, Steve Jobs felt confused and inquired, A breakthrough in the gaming industry? Can you elaborate? Shin proceeded to explain Doom to Steve Jobs who gradually became intrigued and excited by Shin's explanation. Following their conversation, Shin arranged for his video game Doom to be delivered to Steve Jobs for a first-hand look. Time passed and as Steve Jobs played the game himself, he experienced excitement, as the video game clearly surpassed the current 2D pixelated games. Despite being categorized as a 2D game, it was, as Shin explained, simultaneously somewhat 3D. Although it had limitations in its 3D elements, it was sufficient to leave a lasting impression on Steve Jobs. Therefore, in June, Microsoft celebrated the surge in their sales attributed to the video games they were currently releasing. However, come August, Kishin took the stage by releasing Doom for Apple DOS, compatible with Macintosh OS 7. Initially, Microsoft didn't perceive the threat posed by this video game as they were still enjoying a sales boost. However, sales gradually and slightly declined, causing a bit of alarm at Microsoft. Towards the end of August, Apple, on the other hand, experienced a bit of rise in sales. Microsoft was confused because Kishin hadn't released any advertisements for the video game Doom. Consequently, many video game enthusiasts still weren't aware of the game. Meanwhile, whether non-video game fans or dedicated gamers who played Doom, they experienced a feeling of exhilaration and enjoyment as if they had discovered gold among the trash. Despite computers being expensive at the time, when people spread the word about Doom to their friends and showcased the game to them, Apple experienced a slight rise in sales. Furthermore, those who already owned Apple computers purchased the Doom video game, causing a significant surge in sales for Kishin's Doom. Despite the increase in sales for Apple and a significant surge in Kishin's Doom, 
the game remained relatively unknown to casual Americans, except for Apple users or those contemplating Apple for gaming. A considerable portion of the USA's population was still unfamiliar with Doom at this point. Nonetheless, both Apple and Kishin experienced a modest rise in sales despite Doom's limited popularity within the broader video game community. Chapter 197, Doom With the discreet launch of Doom by Kishin, some individuals took notice of its release. George Owl, a visitor to the Kishin store, initially sought to purchase the latest Kishin video games. While perusing the video games section in search of quality titles, he unexpectedly encountered a game called Doom. Positioned prominently on the shelves, George initially assumed it was crafted by an American independent game developer. However, upon closer inspection, he spotted the Kishin logo in the upper right corner of the cover, indicating its origin. In response, George decided to buy it, placing it in his basket. As he approached the cashier with his selected games, including Doom, the cashier furrowed his brows upon noticing George's choice. The cashier remained silent, and George Owl furrowed his brows while inquiring, Is there something wrong? The cashier quickly shook his head, responding, Oh, no, nothing. After a momentary pause while scanning the video game's barcode, he continued, Interestingly, Doom was the game I wanted to play. I've been curious about it since it's published and produced by Kishin, but unfortunately, I don't have an Apple computer. Confused, George asked, an Apple computer? He paused before questioning, why would you need an Apple computer for a video game? The cashier, upon hearing George Owl's question, responded with a hint of surprise, glancing at George as he said, you don't know. Observing the surprise in the cashier's expression, George asked, what don't I know? Noticing George's lack of awareness, the cashier promptly explained, It appears you purchased Doom without realizing it's not compatible with SKES or KES. It wasn't intended for video game consoles. George Owl frowned in confusion, asking, What do you mean? The cashier chuckled and explained, This video game Doom was intended for Apple computers, specifically Macintosh OS 7. George, taken aback, looked at the Doom game in the cashier's hands and exclaimed, that video game Doom wasn't for SKES or KES. The cashier nodded, turning the Doom cover to reveal the logos of Kishin and Apple. On the back, a disclaimer indicated that the game was designed for Apple computers running Macintosh OS 7. Upon realizing this, George Owl was genuinely astonished. He hadn't anticipated that the Kishin-produced Doom was meant for computers. Considering the Kishin Apple Alliance, it wasn't entirely surprising. However, the predicament lay in the fact that he had purchased a Doom game intended for Apple computers, yet he only possessed a Panasonic computer running Microsoft OS. Noticing George's silence, the cashier inquired, Do you still want to buy this Doom game, knowing it's not suitable for SKES or KES? He presented the game to George anticipating whether George would choose to return it or proceed with the purchase. As George Owl weighed his options, considering the possibility of buying an Apple computer or Macintosh OS 7, he knew it would dent his financial savings. Amidst his contemplation, frustrated voices from the line at the cashier counter erupted. How long are you gonna stand there, blonde boy? Don't just stand there, don't keep us waiting. Arg. Damn it. I saved money to play the video game Secret of Mana and Super Metroid, and I was already excited to play it, but some fool just stood there. Grumbled a displeased man in line. The man near the disgruntled individual discreetly shifted away. As George Owl and the cashier noticed the growing impatience of the people in line, the cashier urged George, Sir, please decide quickly, or I'll scan the barcode for this Doom game, and you'll make the purchase. Pressured by the complaints from the people in line, George made a quick decision, saying to the cashier, just scan it. I've decided to buy it, his words gritted through frustration. Observing George Owl's expression, the cashier genuinely wished for him to take a moment to reconsider. However, given the impatient crowd, 
he swiftly scanned the barcode of the Doom game and the other video games George Owl had purchased, placing them all in Kishin's wrap. Accepting the package, George Owl promptly left the line, with annoyed glances from the onlookers. He walked out of the Kishin store, the disapproving stares lingering behind him. Damn! The self-esteem of these people is unbelievable, George Owl muttered with a sigh. Taking the Doom game from the Kishin's wrap, he acknowledged, looks like I need to change my computer. In just a day, he purchased a Macintosh OS 7, deciding to pass on his Panasonic computer with Microsoft OS to his niece. With that, George Owl inserted the Doom video game disc into the Apple computer, muttering, you better not disappoint me. As he watched, George saw the Doom video game being installed on the computer, and after a while, the installation was complete. George Owl promptly opened the Doom video game, muttering, If you disappoint me, I'll never buy anything Kishin related again. He couldn't help but feel the lingering pain in his wallet, despite having substantial savings. Although he had considerable funds, money still stung, and he felt the ache in his heart. As the credits displayed, showing white text copyright Kishin Doom 1993 against a black background, the Doom title emerged on the screen. Below it, red text prompted, press to start. This is it, the moment of truth. George Owl roared, his family in the living room exchanging looks and shaking their heads at the unexpected outburst. With that, George Owl pressed a random key on the keyboard to initiate the game. A gunshot sound effect resonated as he pressed the key, revealing more options on the screen accompanied by music. George Owl selected single mode, leading to additional choices. Opting for the first episode at random, he continued. Next, faced with difficulty options, George Owl chose the easy mode. The music intensified, and as he observed a hand holding a gun on the screen, George moved his mouse, maneuvering his character. Within moments of starting the gameplay, George found it uniquely captivating, feeling his heart thumping with excitement. Chapter 198, Spread the Word George Owl skillfully navigated his character through the immersive 3D world of Doom. Marveling at the difference from traditional 2D pixelated games, he exclaimed, this is unlike any other. As he controlled his character, George focused on the first-person perspective, hands gripping a virtual gun, with character information displayed below the screen. In the heat of the game, George skillfully aimed and fired at enemies, gradually becoming absorbed in the experience. A smirk played on his lips, and he chuckled, hee hee, this game didn't disappoint me. Enhanced by captivating music and dynamic sound effects, George could sense that Doom was destined for success. As time passed, the word about the exclusive video game Doom, designed only for Apple computer with Macintosh OS 7 compatibility, spread rapidly. Enthused by the buzz surrounding this first-person shooting experience, Apple computer owners flocked to the Kishin store to secure their copy. By the end of August, Kishin's Doom experienced a significant surge in sales, showing no signs of decline. Despite Kishin's minimal marketing efforts, the game found its audience as enthusiasts gradually discovered it, some even going the extra mile to purchase an Apple computer with Macintosh OS 7 to indulge in the immersive gameplay. Meanwhile, gaming enthusiasts caught wind of the video game Doom, sparking discussions among friends. Have you heard of Doom? Jordan inquired, prompting a puzzled expression from his friend who shook his head. Doom? Is someone stuck in doom? Jack quipped, eliciting groans from the group at the corniness of his joke. Jordan, smiling, shook his head and proceeded to enlighten those unfamiliar with the video game. Doom is a game released by Kishin that's been the talk of the town lately. While Jack and a few friends who stayed home for vacation weren't aware, some of Jordan's friends were already in the loop. Upon hearing Jordan's words, Jack immediately inquired, saying, Doom? Why haven't I heard of that before? Before Jordan could respond, one of his friends chuckled, How would you know? You've been at home all day playing Super Mario Kart and Killer Instinct. Jack felt a bit embarrassed after the remark. 
Jordan just smiled and explained, Doom is a video game with a first-person shooting gameplay. Pausing to commend Kishin, he added, as expected from Kishin, they've once again pioneered a new genre in the world of video games. The friends who gathered to play the Doom video game nodded in agreement, stating, the writer, narrator, and the concept of the game were all credited to Shinro Suzuki. Among those who were unaware of Doom until now, one of them remarked, Oh, now I'm interested in buying that game. Interesting. I wonder why Kishin didn't market it. If I had known, I would have been one of the first to visit the Kishin store, another mused. Yeah, based on Jordan's praise, it seems like it's worth checking out, added one who was previously unfamiliar with Doom, nodding in agreement. Jordan held significant influence in the group, being the most skilled gamer who occasionally shared advice about video games. When Jordan and the others who had played Doom heard their friends expressing interest in the game, they chuckled. Jordan then clarified, I don't think you're aware that Doom can't be played on SKES and KES. Confusion filled Jack and the others as Jack questioned, what does that mean? Another chimed in, yeah, how come we can't play it on SKES or KES? Isn't Doom a Kishin video game? Some were perplexed, and another asked, where can we play it if not on SKES or KES? Could it be a Game Boy game? Jordan and the recent Doom players exchanged glances, and Jordan shook his head, stating, No. It can't be played on the Game Boy either. Confusion marked Jack's face, his brows furrowed as he turned to Jordan and asked, What do you mean? If it's not playable on any Kishin console, where can we play it? On Tora and Suzuki 16-bit. Jack chuckled, and others joined in. Jordan shook his head with a chuckle and replied, No, that's out of the question too. Observing the increasing bewilderment among friends unfamiliar with Doom, Jordan glanced at those who knew and chuckled. He then clarified, It can only be played on an Apple computer with Macintosh OS 7. When Jack and the others, who had just learned about the video game Doom, expressed surprise, Jack remarked, It can only be played on an Apple computer. Jack and the rest turned their attention to Jordan, who simply nodded. Jack continued, I see, considering the Kish and Apple alliance, it shouldn't be too surprising. But since it's a computer game, is it really as good as you say? Other video game enthusiasts, like Jack, primarily place their faith in video game consoles. They often don't hold computer games in high regard, considering them either subpar or incomparable even to Tora and Suzuki's video games for the 16-bit consoles. Even the new video games heavily marketed by Microsoft don't capture much attention in the eyes of these gaming enthusiasts. Jordan smiled and nodded, saying, I assure you, even though it's a game for the Apple computer, it's exceptional. It introduces a new gameplay concept not seen even on the SKES an innovation that breaks new ground in gaming. Curiosity sparked among Jack and the others, though a hint of doubt lingered. Jordan proceeded to explain the intricacies of the Doom video game. As Jack learned that it deviated from traditional 2D pixelated games, offering a cutting-edge 3D experience, curiosity transformed into genuine interest. They collectively decided to invest their savings in purchasing an Apple computer with Macintosh OS 7, eager to delve into the unique world of Doom. Discussions about the video game Doom among groups of video game fans in the USA are spreading rapidly. The game's unique concept has piqued the interest of many, leading even emerging video game magazines to purchase Doom for review purposes. Chapter 199, The Computer Chronicles featuring Doom in Episode After Kishin's Doom began gaining recognition among video game enthusiasts, its sales surged. The same phenomenon occurred with Apple Macintosh OS 7, as fans were captivated by Doom's impressive graphics, sound, and fast-paced gameplay. One dedicated fan, Richard Lewis, became addicted to Doom and eagerly spread the word to his friends, gradually increasing the game's popularity. This grassroots movement gained momentum until Doom became widely known. The game's popularity reached a point where even the media took notice. Numerous outlets covered and interviewed individuals proudly wearing Doom-themed shirts, 
further amplifying the game's fame. The media coverage started with the popular TV show The Computer Chronicles, broadcasted on the public broadcasting service. This show featured Doom, contributing significantly to the game's widespread recognition. Host Stuart Chifet remarked, We're aware that the gradual rise in popularity of revived video games has even impacted the computer industry. Pausing for emphasis, he continued, But did you know that an unprecedented video game breakthrough has just occurred without your knowledge? Following these words, Stuart Chifet approached a Macintosh OS 7, took a seat in front of the Apple computer, and proceeded to boot it up. Turning to the camera, he declared, If you're at home and have yet to catch wind of this video game, what you are about to witness marks a revolution in the world of gaming. Meanwhile, viewers, who were computer enthusiasts at home and unfamiliar with the video game Doom, were eagerly curious about what host Stuart Chifet was about to unveil. As they observed, Stuart Chifet powered up the Apple computer. Some viewers, noting the computer brand, remarked, Apple computer? Their operating system can't even be compared to Microsoft. Following the boot up, the camera zoomed in on the computer screen. Stuart Chifet took control of the mouse, and the camera captured the cursor as it approached the icon labeled Doom. As the camera honed in on the computer screen, Stuart Chifet's voice resonated, saying, Everyone, some of you may be familiar with this video game, while others might not. Allow me to introduce you to Doom. Following his introduction, Stuart Chifet proceeded to open the Doom video game on the Apple computer. White text against a black background emerged, displaying the copyright symbol followed by Kishin. As the camera captured this, the black background faded, revealing the title Doom accompanied by an intense musical theme. While the camera was fixed on the screen, viewers unfamiliar with Doom looked on with curiosity as Stuart Chifet's voice filled the air. He mentioned, before I forget to mention, this video game was developed by Kishin for Apple Computer. This revelation surprised viewers at home. Developed by Kishin for Apple Computer? How did they miss that? The camera continued focusing on the computer screen, revealing the title of the video game, Doom, and the prompt press the key to start. Stuart Chifet pressed a key on the keyboard to initiate, and a gunshot sound effect echoed. Following this, viewers noticed various options beneath the Doom title, prompting Stuart Chifet to randomly select one. Subsequently, as the video game Doom commenced, both those familiar and unfamiliar with Doom witnessed on broadcast television the groundbreaking scene where the camera captured the first ever first-person shooting video game, Doom. For those viewers previously unaware of the video game Doom, seeing it featured on today's episode of The Computer Chronicles piqued their interest. Watching Stuart Chifet actively engage in playing Doom, relentlessly shooting enemies amid intense yet captivating sound effects and a gripping musical theme, captivated their attention. Stuart Chifet felt the intensity while playing the video game Doom. Randomly choosing the difficulty level to difficult, he found the game challenging and was promptly defeated by enemies, considering he had only played it a few times. Oops, I died, Stuart Chifet's voice resonated as the camera focused on the computer screen. He continued, as you can see, this video game was the first ever first-person shooting game ever made. The camera shifted to Stuart Chifet, who added, developed by a Japanese video game company, it's said to have revived the video game industry and gained popularity within the sector. Pausing, he continued, regardless of the claims, one thing I can affirm is that Kishin's creation, Doom, is a revolutionary video game. It was so groundbreaking in the computer world that it was hard for my show, The Computer Chronicles, to overlook. After making this announcement, the camera zoomed in on Stuart Chifet as the tech or futuristic beat of his TV show played in the background. Stuart Chifet added, If you're eager to experience the video game Doom, you can exclusively play it on the Macintosh OS 7 platform and its subsequent versions. Upon hearing this, Viewers at home who had intended to purchase and install the game on their Microsoft OS-based HP computers expressed immediate frustration with furrowed brows. Come on! I just want to play the game, 
why do I have to buy another computer? They exclaimed. Host Stuart Chifet seemed to anticipate the viewers' reactions as he reassured, I understand some of you might feel frustrated that Doom is exclusively available on the Apple computer platform. However, I can assure you, if you invest in an Apple computer to play Doom, it will be worth it. Most viewers, predominantly computer enthusiasts, perceived Stuart Chifet's words as a promotion and advertisement for the video game Doom. Witnessing the impressive graphics and gameplay, they couldn't help but feel enthused about the game. Unbeknownst to them, Stuart Chifet and the Computer Chronicles program were being compensated by Apple for marketing. This move stemmed from Apple's impatience, considering Kishin's reliance on word of mouth wasn't meeting their expectations. Following this episode of the Computer Chronicles, Apple's higher UPS were not disappointed, the sales of their Apple computers surged. Several media outlets also began to take notice of the video game Doom, hailed as a breakthrough in the world of video games. The fact that Doom was developed by the Japanese company Kishin, known for making waves in the gaming industry, added to its allure. Moreover, the popularity of Jurassic Park remained steadfast, with people absorbing the fact that the film had grossed over a billion dollars. Chapter 200, Microsoft Dilemma with the rise in sales of Doom and Apple computers, other computer brands and the Microsoft OS experienced a slight decline in sales. While the impact was minimal, it still affected overall sales stability. During the board of directors meeting, Will Gates expressed his concern, stating, The Kish and Apple alliance has proven to be more troublesome than I initially anticipated. He paused and continued. I couldn't believe that Kishin would develop a video game with limited 3D features. This is truly alarming. The board members nodded in agreement as one member spoke up, I've personally played the video game Doom, and I must say, it's unlike any other game I've experienced. It would be a shame if it's exclusively available on Apple computers, don't you think? He paused, capturing the attention of the board members, and continued. I propose that we negotiate with Kishin to bring the Doom game to our operating system platform. This could restore our sales to normal levels, don't you agree? Those present found merit in the suggestion, with some expressing their support, I agree. A quality game like Doom shouldn't be limited to a single platform, it's wasting its potential. Yeah, I think so too. Upon hearing the consensus, Will Gates chimed in. I share the same sentiment. However, considering the alliance between Kishin and Apple, do you think Kishin would be willing to make the game available on our Microsoft OS? Upon hearing this, the board members shared the sentiment, expressing their willingness for Kishin to make the Doom video game available on their platform. However, uncertainty lingered, as they questioned whether Kishin would agree, highlighting the existing alliance with Apple. The dilemma arose who would betray the other in such a clear alliance. As the board members exchanged thoughtful glances, Will Gates spoke up, acknowledging the collective contemplation, I understand some of you may be pondering how we could develop our own video game similar to Doom. Observing nods from some board members, Will Gates smiled and remarked, you've made a valid point. Creating a video game similar to Doom is an alternative, but I must remind you that it would be both costly and time-consuming. We lack the same research and advanced video game development capabilities as Kishin. Acknowledging the challenges, some board members nodded in agreement, and one member added, I agree. It would be challenging to replicate the same video game, especially if it was developed using a proprietary program by Kishin. Will Gates, along with other board members, nodded in unison. Exactly, Will Gates affirmed. Doom was indeed created through a program developed by Kishin, and that's the challenge. Without information on such a program and lacking the same video game development and advanced technologies, even if we can cover the cost, it will be a time-consuming endeavor. Upon hearing Will Gates' words, the board members concurred with his assessment. Realizing that negotiating with Kishin was the most viable option, they considered that despite Kishin's alliance with Apple, it didn't guarantee exclusive access to their video games. Additionally, 
the user base of Microsoft OS exceeded that of Apple computers with the Apple operating system. This dilemma left Will Gates at a crossroads, and he ultimately decided that initiating contact with Kishin for negotiations was the best course of action, especially with Shinro Suzuki, the founder and CEO who held true control over Kishin. Some business people harbor doubts about whether a young man named Shinro Suzuki truly holds control over the business or if he is merely being manipulated by someone else. The skepticism arises from reports indicating that Shinro Suzuki is the son of the current chairman of the Suzuki Group, Shiro Suzuki. The news that the Suzuki Group oversees the affairs of companies led by Shinro Suzuki has become a topic of discussion in the business world. Despite these individuals typically focusing on financial matters and strategies to grow their wealth, the intriguing question of whether Shinro Suzuki is a puppet of the Suzuki Group captures their attention. This speculation adds an interesting dimension, highlighting that even among savvy and astute business people, there remains gossip and curiosity regarding the true power dynamics within Kishin whether it is truly under Shinro Suzuki's control or under the influence of the Suzuki Group. The outstanding profitability of Shinro Suzuki's Kishin companies has drawn significant attention within the business world. Despite numerous critics opposing Kishin, its remarkable success has left many in the business community envious. Perhaps it is precisely this success that has fueled the opposition. In essence, if the Suzuki Group truly controls Kishin, business people can only lament the fact that such a highly profitable enterprise is under the influence of the Suzuki Group. While many in the business world considered the idea of the Suzuki Group controlling Kishin highly unlikely, given Suzuki Group's decline in the video games sector and its partnership with Tora, some harbored suspicions about Kishin. The skepticism arose from the anomaly that, despite Kishin's continuous growth, it remained a private company rather than going public. The contrast of a private company challenging a global-scale public company intrigued those in the business community. In Tokyo, Japan, when the video game Doom became available around September, numerous computer enthusiasts were eager and excited to experience the game. Various media outlets in Japan covered the gradual rise in popularity of the video game Doom, originally from the USA. Aware of Doom, Tora and Suzuki took a more serious tone. Before Doom's release, they were working on video games with limited 3D but still in the realm of 2D. However, they didn't anticipate Kishin surpassing them by developing and releasing Doom, a superior video game to what they were currently working on. Simultaneously, Tora and Suzuki attempted to infiltrate Kishin's company to gain insights into Kishin's future developments in video games, seeking to stay informed. Thanks for listening.